Greetings and welcome to the People's Ascension. We are back for the actual season finale of season two of RPGs Uncovered. Uh, yeah, this will be our last episode covering Heroic Chord. It has been such an amazing time playing this game, learning this game, uh, running this game, making a cool story for this game. Uh, I've had a blast with the entire process of it all. Uh, and it's all going to come to a culmination today with just a nice chill conversation about, you know, how, uh, how the game went, uh, both the story of the game and the actual, uh, you know, mechanics, playing, uh, running, teaching, learning aspect of the game, because uh, both are very important. So we're going to have a conversation amongst ourselves. We're going to talk about, you know, rules, tools, and themes and all that, and talk about if this game is for you. Uh, and this is a fantastic game. There's a lot of, a lot of great, a lot of great qualities to it. I had a blast with it. Uh, hey. So, uh, yeah, before we get started with that, just a few simple announcements as always uh yes if you're new here uh well you're coming in at a strange time because this is the final episode uh but all of the previous episodes are available over on our youtube so you can go check that out links should be down below and all of the the words down there uh yeah we we had a great first episode learning the game uh, talking, talking with Cat here, the creator, about how it was all put together, inspirations, uh, mechanics, all of that good stuff, and then we dived into a four-part mini series, demo play series, and it was it was fantastic. I've had so much fun doing these RPGs uncovered seasons because you can get such great stories out of uh, out of a four-part adventure, uh, and and this one. This one is a great example of it. The Creeping Tangle was an amazing story. Uh, very, very much because of the players that I had, the characters that they made, uh, all the fun, creative ways that they used their various abilities. And of course, the game helped facilitate that because it's uh, well baked into the game. So if you missed any of the demo play series, we're going to be talking about that quite a bit today because it's a good way to relate with, with, uh, with what we learned. But you can go and check that out on YouTube. You can also find the first of our... Uh, bite-sized tutorials up there more are coming i feel like i say this every week but man it has been a week more are definitely coming just because this is the last episode of uh of the stream series does not mean i am done with heroic chord uh as far as as far as today yes uh welcome to chat feel free to chat along uh drop in your questions comments concerns and we will bring that up uh, because this is uh, this is the post game analysis. So if you have any questions about the game, uh, now's the time to ask, and we have a great crew here to help answer those questions. Uh, you can also drop by over on our Discord. I'll be keeping an eye on that best I can. Uh, and you know, if you want to engage in there as well, we have a lot of great uh, a lot of great content creators over there, a lot of great players and general TTRPG enthusiasts. So if you're looking for a game, there is either somebody there who has made it or can point you in the right direction. So come hang out. It's free for everyone to just drop in, say hi, uh, engage as they will, and find a new game. Uh, okay, and of course you can. If you like what we're doing and you want to see more of what we're doing, you want to see more RPGs uncovered seasons and uh, unlock all kinds of fun extras like character art and uh, emotes and animated intros and all kinds of maps, music, all kinds of great stuff. Best way to do that is head over to our support sites, Patreon and Ko-Fi. Anything we get from there goes straight back into the channel, and most notably straight back into the community of fantastic creators that I just love working with. Uh, writers, artists, game creators. Uh, so many great people out there in the community, and RPGs Uncovered is all about uh, showcasing those people, working with those people, highlighting those people, and most importantly, supporting those people. Uh, of course, that requires support of our own, so if you want to head over to ko -Fi, and Patreon. You can find a lot of great supporter rewards over there. Uh, things like after shows, which we do at the F the end of every show, uh, and fun player and GM insights like character sheets and enemy sheets, uh, crisis sheets in this in this instance, uh, and all kinds of other little fun 
tidbits of uh, a fun insight and information, as well as written reference guides to go along with the bite-sized tutorial. So if you're more of a printout and reference at the table kind of person, you will have those there as well. Uh, okay, I think I've been... Uh, I think I've been chatting long enough. Let's throw it over to our uh, our players, our cast here for our usual introductions. And I am most excited just to just to hear from uh, from you guys and and you guys, uh, players and audience alike. Uh, so for one final time, at least with the opening of uh, of the stream, let's have everyone say hello. Uh, Kat, of course, being the reason we are all here, the reason we all Yay! got to do this. Uh, how are you this morning? Tell us about yourself and this fantastic I, game. I am alive and well, thank you. I'm Kat. I like to write games. I like to lay games out and do them to be pretty. Um, I slept in today, so my brain isn't fully loaded <laughs> and... I thank you in advance for your understanding. <laughs> um, you can find games that I have done at peachgardengames.com. If you go there, you can also find the official Heroic Chord podcast, Sword of Symphonies, in which my good, cool friends have helped me playtest this game and take it to where it is now. Um, I have another podcast coming up that I've started recording called Roar to Heaven with my other big game, Blazing Him. And... That is considerably more intense and requires me to be considerably stricter of a GM, and I'm working on it. But mostly I'm a big squish baby. Hmm. Morning! Yes. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, yes, I linked that in chat so you can go over go over to that uh, to oh, their yay. website and check out all of their other uh, other great content. Pick up your own copy of Heroic Chord because it's a great game. The uh, playtest okay. version is free. Yeah, yeah. You can pick you up a playtest version for free, or you could uh, head over to head over to Itch and get the amazingly beautiful hand painted version of the rule set, uh. which which I just adore. Uh, and all the the overlay assets that I used for our background here all came from that book. Ah. Uh, uh. All, all the all the beautiful lavender and uh, you know grass grass motifs, great stuff, great Damn. stuff. Ah. Uh, okay, who else do we have here? The two people we usually have here. Uh, Pat, good morning. You are in a different place today. Good morning. Yeah, uh, I am uh, seven hundred and fifty miles from home in a hotel. Uh, my younger sister had a baby. I got to come and meet my nephew for the first time, which was very exciting. Um, I am Pat or Badger the Cynic, uh, you know, here and on uh, Twitter. Um, I will be launching my own Twitch channel soon, uh, twitch.tv slash Badger the Cynic. I'll be playing my own uh, Savage Worlds game, which I've been running for two years now. The next season or next chapter we're going to go live with. And uh, my players have expressed an interest in playing Heroic Chord there as well. Um, it, it's not surprising these these particular characters really resonated well with the rule set here because they like finding creative ways through encounters. They, they don't default to, okay, we have to fight the person in front of us to get through here. They have done their best to minimize that in this game so i think that uh they in particular will will have an excellent time with heroic court mm. Oh. Mm. you must tell me everything i said this last week but you must tell oh, me of course everything. of course yeah. all right uh yeah more coming from uh from badger here so keep an eye out on his stuff uh, i'm sure you will be able to find more information on that uh on you know the people's ascension twitter who um, i'm sure i'll be retweeting anything you put out uh as well as our discord because of course he's there uh and of course rounding us out as always donna good morning hello always good a pleasure to have you with morning. us yes it's always a pleasure to be here i'm just very excited i'm very chipper um hello everybody my name is donna you can find me on twitter at shabro right now i'm pursuing more of a voice acting gig and more of a 
more of that, but I am always down to play a really fun TTRPG, which is why I was glad to play Heroic Core because it was a buttload of fun. Um, very excited for this after show of sorts, and I'm very excited to talk about how much I love this game. Yeah. Aww. So yeah, that's that's it about me. I mean, guys, it's just going to be four hours of us gushing about the game and cat losing. I'm going to make mind. that sound. Yeah. I'm going to make that sound a lot. Yeah. So get used to it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. And of course, uh, hello to everybody in chat and thank you so much for the follow. I see we already had somebody pick up, uh, one of the, one of the, the beautiful rules of, uh, of Hero Court hand painted version. So, uh, you know, success. <laughs> I, uh, I, I managed to show somebody a, a great new game that they're enthusiastic about. So I, I very much, uh, I, <laughs> that's exactly why I'm here. Makes my little heart tomato all nice and juicy. Uh, anyway, that's where we're, that that's my brain state right now. Uh, yeah, we have we have heart tomatoes. Go check those out. Those are fun. Uh, okay, yeah, let's uh, let's just dive into this. Uh, let's see. How do I believe we're gonna we're gonna start off with while while we're uh, while we're waiting for chat uh, and just kind of hanging out. Of course, chat at any time chime in with any uh with any questions comments concerns or just general theories general uh uh you know revelations or or reactions to anything that we had going on but because we didn't get in an after show at the end of last uh episode for our season finale i definitely want to talk about that and i actually do prefer doing this uh doing this live doing this for everybody to see uh because i i like giving the audience closure i guess for any of the stories uh whereas all of the other after shows are of course supporter based uh you can find those on our support site but i like doing the last one that everybody can see uh so we can all talk about our our crazy con conspiracy theories whether they turned out to be true uh ask all kinds of questions so if you have any questions about the about the creeping tangle series itself definitely ask those but also feel free to chime in with any uh any rules questions or anything like that and uh we'll do a quick conversation well i don't know how quick it's going to be like i said this could be four hours of gushing uh but we're going to have a conversation yeah. about uh about how the show went and that's going to transition to how the actual gameplay went and talking about rules tools and themes and all that so i think the best way to start out with all of this is how we usually start out all of our after shows and i think we're going to jump right into memory time memory time uh so it's it's been a week and man for me at least it's been a week uh so i hope everybody has 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 gotten uh the the last game in the series in their mind uh would would we like to do a general recap actually before we get to uh to memory time how how would how would you guys uh recap the entire series for us Who well uh, historically that? we probably won't do it in order yeah yeah we can't <clears throat> yeah I'm just throwing that out there <laughs> so the whole series in order would be uh <laughs> okay i'm gonna try okay we had dinner and it wasn't very good because the mushrooms were bitter gross but we, yep. but we did our very best and then we <laughs> went Season, to uh, episode one opening right there yeah, yeah. yeah very started good. with bad mushrooms we went yeah. to Rose Rest because there were rumors about a seer there who'd been having troubling visions and also Doyle's smudge. map had a weird smudge there and we were like, okay, let's go find out what's happening. And we had strawberries and I was made anxious by the people of Rose Rest because they were friendly. And <laughs> then we went to the Seer's Yurt. We went to go meet Maud and Maud was in the midst of a vision that was not going great for them at all. And um was causing a great deal of distress and perhaps harm. So we did our very best to help. Doyle and Marius kind of got sucked into the vision a little bit, which came back several times to bother them. Yep. Um, Kalos supported from the outside and made the very good Free, baby! Yes. And thus proving 
Kalos is the one with the sense in the park. Yeah, Kalos kept the vision from getting haunted. Yeah. Which I think <laughs> is is a very, like, very important yeah. task. <laughs> that True. Would gone, it would have gone much worse, we found out later on, if Kalos yeah. hadn't made the decisions that she did. Mm -hmm. Um, So, in the end... Uh, Doyle and Marius were fully in the vision and there was a very horrible city full of vines um, and a bird that made it happen. And yeah, the bird. horrible city full of vines dragged Doyle off and we were like, dang. And then um, Marius went to explore the city and then he got dragged off as well. But before he got dragged off, he saw just like a huge vine monster and was like, dang. And then the party came too. And that's the end of episode one. Does anyone want to try episode yeah. two in order? Uh, episode two, we we explored the discovery feature a little bit more. Yeah, that's good. Um, that, that's we, good. We each we each did some discovery roles. Uh, I found something useful that we were able to use to make herbicide. Uh, Marius found a beautiful, wondrous countryside that gave us some inspiration. Uh, and Callus. <laughs> Found a deer that that was in some trouble. Um, it it had been taken over by a vine monster and needed to be put down. So, so that was mildly traumatic, but you know. Uh, and then we went to the actual city. Um, and found that it was, in fact, taken over by vines. This was a very literal vision. This was... None of it was metaphorical except possibly the bird. Uh, and even that, probably... There are probably several birds that died horribly from this. So, you know. Um, we tried to scout the area. And in the process, Doyle got attacked by the vines. And, you know, almost taken in by them. We tried to sneak in and discovered that that was impossible without a diversion that would have involved burning down the city. And so in the least subtle way possible, we all climbed on the brilliantly white cloud elk Wee. and flew over the walls, yes. announcing our presence to everyone. <laughs> I did that, yeah. Yeah. Um, you tried so hard. We, we did our absolute best to save the town there. And by we, I really mean Marius, because I'm pretty sure everyone else had written the town off. Um, <laughs> and so Marius essentially freed the, the townspeople that could be saved. Some of them had plant matter in their brains, and that's not something, you know, you can really come back from. But the ones that weren't at that stage were saved. Uh, at big board with Doyle and Maud. Yes, at mm -hmm. great cost to Marius, Doyle, and Maud. Uh, Shout out to Kalos once again, crushing it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then you know, you know, Marius, Marius basically sacrificed themselves for the town, and to make sure everybody else could get there. Okay, we get to this well with this wriggling vine creature in the bottom and just dump herbicide and Molotov cocktails down there, uh, which, you know, results in kind of an explosion and everything fades to white. And that was, uh, that was our second episode in a nutshell. You can do it, Donna. You're up. <laughs> True. Okay. So, boom, big explosion. We're all passing out. Nap, nap time. Nap time. Oh God! And then, <laughs> and then we um we wake up casually and oh, let me think. Oh yeah, and then we went to the north. We went to the north because um yeah. there there was there like another. Well, there was the whole sequence in the town itself. That's true. I the important oh, takeaway from that was Dr. Kalos, yes. which was some of my favorite stuff in the story. Dr. Kalos and unsupervised Doyle. Yeah. It was just, Dr. okay, Kalos that's right. Unsupervised Doyle and friendly, clueless Scatter Mario. The, the shenanigans yeah. of an entirely scattered party cold opening. Yeah. 
So yeah. we like so cows was like slapping bandages on people and when they like complained about like how unkind her bedside manner was, she was like, You're not dead though. So like yeah, take what? take the victory. Cry about Do- it. <laughs> Do- Doyle falls down. <laughs> The well, and then passes out at the bottom of the well. Yeah, at the bottom of the well, and Mars is like, "Hey, Callus, did you do you know where Doyle is?" And Callus is like, "Don't care." And so then, <laughs> Marius is like, "Well, I gotta take this into my own hands." Goes down. We make like make that stuff. We go down. Uh, by we, I mean Marius. Marius picks up Doyle, and then everybody's back up, safe and sound. And we just chill out for a little bit. And, um, and of we... course, the the vine heart that was found at yep. the bottom of the well. The oh, whole reason true. Doyle decided that he needed to be in that well. He yes. knew that there was going to be something down there. Some remnant of the monster that we burned and poisoned. Uh, and sure enough, there was in fact a heart made of thorns. Yeah, and so you grabbed it, and then you're like, "All right, I put I it in a bag this. because I was smart and didn't want to handle it with my bare hands." Mm-hmm. True. And then the oh, next day, yeah. we all like wake up, and then Maud's like, "Hey, give me that!" Clasps <laughs> like, it in between their hands, and like they're bleeding, and we're just we're all like, "What's going on?" Freaking out. Um. And then by the time Maud's done with whatever they were doing, the vine heart is just like a lump of plant matter at this point. It's lost a lot of its uh, magical abilities in our eyes. And Maud's got like bleeding hands and we're like, oh, God, deal with that. So. But then they weren't bleeding. All of a sudden they weren't bleeding. True. Yep. That, that, was where, that was where my concerns about Maud stemmed from that that moment it was like oh she's like feeding on ancient powers this is a problem yes i think we were all a little bit like hey what's going on <laughs> like, should we be allowing you to do this this doesn't seem like a thing that's healthy um and if it is healthy that's also a concern <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then we had to go to the north mm. because there was another heart up there right or is that wrong because um the doe that you that you did a mercy kill to was not the only deer that was involved in a fight against the tangle and yes. the buck was infected and had gone north oh there we go yes okay so which was I'll come back to semi revealed in yet another one of maud's vague visions right yeah. That they get one hundred percent accurate visions, and so we're all like heading up north, and then I'm gonna just watch me skip over everything, <laughs> and then, and then <laughs> there's a horror, there's a horror, and there's a tangle, um, and we're like, dang, it's a three way fight, we gotta figure this out, and dang. so I had to save the archaeologists. In, yeah, and we had to say the archaeologists, and oh my gosh, and we did. I think it was business as usual where Doyle and Marius really went like, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna scatter, we're gonna take damage," and Cal's was like, "Great for y'all, I'm gonna be right here." Um, <laughs> and, her. and then like there was a lot of like. Marius being like, yeah, like, hey, I'm a crusader, you're a crusade. Like, I'm reporting for duty. And they were like, hey, like, actually, you may not, like, you may be on our side. Okay, we should fight with you. So we fought against the creeping tangle or the tangle monster with the horror. I'm pretty sure. Yes. Yep. And that was really fun. <laughs> It was. It was good. That was that was that might have been my favorite fight that we had, but they were all really good. Mm. Mm. But I think the fight in the ruins in the north was my fave. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. We'll loop okay. back around to that. Oh yeah, I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Before that, Marius 
went into these ruins and Cal's like, I'm coming with you. And there's like some low level horrors and we quickly like dealt with it. But then Cal's like, uh, <laughs> broke the ruins. And so, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's just how it is. Providing covering fire to make sure Marius didn't get jumped. Yeah. Blasted a hole inside of a, a ruin, took down a yeah. priceless historical artifact. Oh well. Thankfully, uh, Doyle was left behind for that one and was guarding Maud. Mm -hmm. well, left yes. himself behind for that one. Yes. <laughs> Very mm -hmm. smart. Mm -hmm. Doyle thought that Maud being unsupervised would turn into a problem later. Maud, who was uh, going through a bit of a, a metamorphosis of, yeah, Maud, of their Maud own. Yeah, Maud was having a time of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, coming a bit more put together, assertive, direct, uh, driven. Started developing those those glistening pink eyes. Yeah. And then episode four. Yeah. Danny, if you want to take episode four, or should I go again? I'm not very good at this memory <laughs> stuff. You, you Basically what happens is I'm like, I wonder what happened. Then y'all talk and I'm like, oh my God, it's all coming back to me. <laughs> oh, okay. I just, this is my role in my casual games as well. I'm the rememberer. Um, so after the fight in the north, we awakened with a party that did not know what to do because Maud had shown us a vision of the headquarters of the Tangle, the Tangle itself, in yep. an ancient castle. Or it was an ancient castle. In the vision, it was hard to tell. And then we were like, well, dang, we got to do this once and for all. And Callus was like, do we? Yes. And Marius is like, you don't. You don't gotta. And Kalos is like, I'm tired of people telling me I gotta. And Marius is like, I'm not telling you you gotta. <laughs> and Kalos is like, everyone expects me to do stuff. And everyone's like, we don't expect you to. And then eventually we all were like, well, we gotta do this. We, we all took our own routes to get to we gotta do this. And it was actually, despite my glib summary, uh, a very excellent series of character interactions, I think. Yeah, where we unraveled a lot of like complicated feelings that our characters had toward uh, the concept of adventure and mm -hmm. the concept of helping people. And so we um, we got we sent messages back to Rose Rest and we convinced the horrors to join us as an army and Rose Rest raised a militia, and we kept some edge successes that meant that they were pretty boned. Yeah. That'll come up later. And then we went to the Aurora Fortress to also see if we could get a contingent of Crusaders to join us um, as well. And we succeeded at that. So we went to this... And of course, the, the ghost army you befriended. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep. The horrors. So we had the horrors, we had the militia, and we had the crusaders, and we we all met up on the Velt at this, like, thoroughly entangled Magitech ruin full of automata and, uh, like, enthorned people and vines and a labyrinth, which I was very excited about. Marius loves those. And... Um, we we talked strategy like a lot um and then mod was like hey i have to show you all something i'm a dragon and we were like <laughs> bt dubs that explains why you're so weird and mod was like what and we were like what it's pretty and much how that mod interaction was, went yeah <laughs> mod was like i need to i need uh, to do my own thing here because the tangle and i are ancient enemies and we were like we'll help yeah, that really that was a big relief to Doyle because Doyle had also seen Maud um, have another strange interaction with another Vine Heart, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and also go and touch a horror. And I was just like, you know, these are these are more concerns. And then Maud's just like, by the way, I'm a dragon. Oh yeah, no, okay, okay, that's fine. That was, that was actually the best option for us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> on the list of things that that could have been, you know. That, that that's up there that's mm -hmm. that's at the top mm -hmm. yeah, yeah we're pretty yeah. much just like oh yeah we never doubted for a second that yeah, like yeah. you were yeah yeah yeah. Hurt, hurt. yeah so uh we determined that our plan was to sneak inside and try and take uh control of the ancient cannons and um we would be an advanced party that would try and turn the tide of these automatic defense mechanisms 
so that the rest of the um, armies that were with us could launch a full assault and the tango would be distracted from Maud, who was doing dragon nonsense to it. And um, the fight went pretty harrowingly because it was a mean fight with cruelty it was a in mean its heart. Fight. And we took some hits and we did some huge spells and everyone unlocked, everyone except Kalos unlocked their signature spell at the wrong time. Yep. Doyle did it too early and didn't take full Way advantage of the Saturn early. refresh. And Marius did it too late and had no time left in the encounter to use the scatter that he regained. But Kalos, as usual, got it right. <laughs> that's why that's why I was just like, you know, perfect time. I got it. And <laughs> that's what you get when you um, stay back yeah. and you watch. And then you're like, oh, I got it. <laughs> I figured it out. We lost the militia because Kalos was like, come on, let's all go die. Mostly you guys. <laughs> And um, they were like, okay, cool, die time. And um, except for you, we guess. And Kalos was like, correct. And um, you guess? then we lost the ghosts because the ghosts were fighting with their ancient ally, Mod, and we didn't lose the Crusaders. So we could have lost everybody. We didn't. Mm -hmm. um, we also, we, we gained uh, some of the automata. We, mm -hmm. we yeah. turned them to our side. And so then I was very focused on that aspect of this fight, and it was cool and good because mm -hmm. it worked great. Yeah, that that extra expendable, um, you know, four four successes from turning in a a, a, a mass yeah, combat unit. We absolutely needed it. <laughs> yeah, that was yeah. smart. <laughs> you pushed really just hard for it. it. It was just how I talk. <laughs> the um. And then Doyle was like, I'm going to do the cannon thing now. Amaris was like, get in the cannon thing. I will defend the door. No one's going to get you. Do the cannon thing. But what we didn't know was that Doyle made the cannon thing explode. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Doyle and Maud worked together to do a great big huge attack with dragon power and lasers mm -hmm. at the tangle to finish off the fight. Uh... And it was profoundly cool. Yep. Until the cannon control center exploded. The the yes. desperate dragon revolution cannon. The yes. desperate dragon revolution cannon, which was very rad. Mm -hmm. And so it went explodey. The party took a nap. And because that's what we <laughs> like to do. We like to take naps. And um, somebody else will sort out the rubble while we nap. <laughs> yeah. And then we woke up and we were like, Doyle, no! I mean, Mar Marius yeah. tried, and then the, the Legion was like, you are severely concussed. Yeah, <laughs> you, have, you have been very badly uh, injured, Monsieur. <laughs> yeah. And um, maybe it's nap time for you. And in the end, was Doyle okay? We don't know. We don't know. Then we did some ending scenes where Kalos finally worked up the nerve to go back and see her family again with her friends. How many? We don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Marius returned to his work as a shipwright, but he sent some letters to friends, including pointedly a letter that was going to Rose Rest. How many letters? We don't know. But it was injured. It was revealed that uh, he uh, was seriously injured and now limps. So he's um, that's the lad going forward. Um, this is true. You can't. You can't move him. He's okay. <laughs> and the, um, in the end, we got a shot of the plateau at Rose Rest, and there was, there was a scent of roses, which is like, is Maud okay? Maybe. Probably. Yeah. Maybe. It was a beautiful ending that I'm being very glib about, but we had a great time. I I really enjoyed that season finale. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I I've enjoyed all of all of my games endings, but this this one this one was was great. Uh, yeah, because it it just everything fell in such perfect narrative beats, and that's so much on you guys for you know contributing that in a narrative sense because i can only do so much with planning and pacing uh so you you guys really took the narrative and really hit Yay. all of those great narrative beats 
Yay! Uh, Yay! Okay, yeah. So that's uh, that's the whole season in a nutshell. So if you missed any of it, that was that was actually a really good recap. Um, yeah, team. I I like doing those recaps. I posted this in chat. I really like doing those recaps because it it helps me see what uh what stuck, what didn't stick, what was fun for you guys, what just kind of either got lost or became unimportant or whatnot. Uh, and to make sure that we're all on the on the same page and that we all uh, it it it's a it's a sneaky way of getting feedback without asking for critical feedback. Um. <laughs> Yeah. And it's just a good way to get everybody's head in the game because now we all remember what happened so we can talk about uh well we can talk about what happened. So let's uh that was a great recap but let's actually pick up as we were going to in the beginning of this with memory time specifically for last episode uh for the finale. Well... So what uh what what really most stood out to each of you in this finale and I know there was a lot to to unpack here. Oh, memory. Memory time a week later. I I know. <laughs> um, I have two memories because one of them is that during the fight we were all just like we're planning on getting scatter refreshes from finishing our keys. Mm -hmm. So let's just cast huge spells. That's where we got Grim Dominion. That's where mm -hmm. we got, what was it? Uh, something Revolution. Um, Dominion Revolution, I think it was. Yes, Dominion Revolution. Yeah. Dominion was a good word that we made wonderful yeah. use of. Mm -hmm. so Dominion watching, is always a good word. <laughs> watching the three of us just go ham with huge spells, that was extremely cool and good. But I also really liked the like JRPG montage ending. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was yeah. very kind of carefully uh, planned cinematography wise to conceal whether or not Doyle and Maud were okay. And I thought that was cute. <laughs> like... Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I, I, I did like the, the ending that we came up with there. Um, I think for, for memory time, though, for me, it's got to be Kalos making a speech to the militia saying essentially like, we we need you all to die mm -hmm. so that the three of us can live long enough to save your friends and family back home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no what? You all should die now so that we can make sure your friends survive next week. And was she wrong? I mean, <laughs> yeah. They well, watch a valuable we don't time. Know about Doyle, but <laughs> yeah, she may have been wrong a little, oh, but... just a little. But yeah, I I really liked um I don't know, I, I really liked how narratively like the first half really like kicked through during the fight. Like I like all of our interactions. I thought that we all I, I it's a very like JRPG or anime thing to say, but like we all kind of raised death flags and I was like, well, here we go. <laughs> and, then, yep. and then we just like we played through whether or not it's like the option for like failure or the option for like success and like what does that mean for each of our characters and what narratively would make the most sense and that was really good i i just i enjoyed that like a lot yeah i i would say it was it was interesting to hear cat that you thought the the three way fight between the tangle and the ghosts was your favorite fight because this last one was was clear was was easily my favorite crisis yeah uh, pr probably probably mostly because of my own mind theater because like that was just oh no that was so much um all four fights were rad mm -hmm. there was not a single fight that i thought was not extremely cool but i just liked the uh the faction dynamics mm -hmm. uh that were laid out for us in the three-way fight in the north where it was like i think also if i remember correctly destroy was slightly easier than redirect Mm -hmm. but um and i love fights where we take the harder option because we feel like it's the correct thing to do mm -hmm. and that was uh yeah it was i thought like intellectually there was a lot of fun things i got to play with in the episode three fight i have a question for sure. everybody 
And by that, I mean for me and Donna. Donna, you just mentioned that we all raised death flags, and it's true. We did it. We did that. So here's my question. Kalos gets KO'd in the final fight. Yeah. RGM asks you, does Kalos make it? What's your answer? Uh, I think narratively, it should be a yes for me. I think it's too much of a tragedy otherwise for her to not make it especially because of like the role playing that we did together with like marius and callus and like the whole like freak out and like meltdown where she was like like i am tired of you telling me like hey if you don't want to do it you don't have to do it like i now i feel like i have to do it and then like that whole talk and then also where like marius was like hey like i went back home and it wasn't like great but like i'm glad i did it and like the sort of I think the biggest death flag that I purposefully raised was like when we're all done with this, we should all go back to my house and have yeah, yeah, a bunch yeah, of that was a big one. Was like, it's a death flag. <laughs> That's a big one. If I was playing a JRPG, I'd be like, okay, I'm taking all Kalos's equipment off. And I'm not seeing it again. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I think uh, it just so happened that, like, narratively, I'm not sure that she would have been in the right place. Like Doyle is in the cannon when it blew up. Like, yep. but like if had the situations been reversed like doyle was on the outside and callus was in it i probably would have said yes like oh no like no like callus doesn't make it she's yeah. she's not able I, to continue going uh, i think that's it's sort of an interesting hypothetical because thinking about it narratively if, if things played out the way they did doyle is in the cannon the cannon blows up uh and somewhere else in the maze or in the city or somewhere nearby, Kalos act also actually went to, to no hit points, full scatter, you know, potentially dead. I would say narratively then, Doyle should die, Kalos should live. I, I think that that with us playing up the, well, we'll be there with you when you go home. And like narratively that, that creates sort of a, a more interesting story mm-hmm. than you know, everybody's okay, or, you know, Doyle lives and Kalos doesn't. But without that, I like leaving Doyle's death ambiguous. Mm-hmm. I like I like it where you can sort of choose your own narrative. You know, you decide whether you think that Doyle lived or, or you think that Doyle, you know, died. I think he's fine. <laughs> it's, like a, it's, it's like a nice... Ending if they are fine, and it's a nice ending if, if it's not. <laughs> yeah, but I think it was just like the placement of like everybody at the end. But yeah, I think I think what of the way narratively that I would have been okay is if we did like because I know we were like a little crunched for time, which is totally fine. I mean, like we said, like we, this could have lasted for like eight hours, like of, of a play time. Like it was a long and like. If we had detoured so that we visited Callus's family in the north when we were there, I think if the GM was like, "Does Callus make it?" After we had did that, I would mm-hmm. be like, "Nah." <laughs> like I'm yeah. like, "My Callus, like yeah. take care." Oh, yeah. Unfinished business. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think like my own death flags were highly conditional, and I don't think anyone's surprised to hear that. Like, if Marius drops to zero because he's taking a hit for an ally or, like, defending an ally, I'd let him stay down. Because that those are the very specific death flags he's putting up are heroic sacrifice death flags. I think if he just got, like, conked in the back of the head by an enemy he didn't see coming, he'd mm-hmm. be fine. Yeah. Yeah, but, even, uh... even in games that don't... Um... Because in Heroic Horde, it's, it's very explicit in the rules, death is a player choice. And there's a, there's a number of games that work that way. And I, I think that's actually a really useful narrative tool to... I, I think that's a very useful rule and, and, and tool that can be used yeah. between the player and the GM to negotiate the narrative. 
Uh, because I, I love that you guys have, have critically thought about this and been like, if X happens, yeah, I don't survive. But if, if Y happens, yeah, I did it, unresolved issues and stuff. You're thinking about it from a narrative creative perspective instead of just, I want my character to live. Uh, which I mean, which I get, uh, especially in, in larger campaigns, uh, especially in, in games where you spend hours putting together a character, you've spent... Uh, dozens dozens of hours developing that character both both story-wise and for level ups and whatnot uh it, it can be it can be disappointing to to have a character get killed uh but i i love when players are encouraged to look at the situation from a narrative perspective and ask themselves would it be more interesting if my character died and be okay with dying if the answer is yes yeah, and I the reason I always put that I always put that rule in my adventure games, it's in Blazing Him as well, mm -hmm. is um that I don't want your character's death to be a personal bummer for you. Mm -hmm. And that means I want the player to be an active participant in the conversation about whether or not a character dies. Mm -hmm. Because like when D D just informs you that anticlimactically your character has died, it kind of sucks sometimes. Oh yeah. If you're lucky, the fight has structured itself in a way that you can spin a cool narrative out of it. But that doesn't always happen. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a bummer. And, like, I'm I'm okay with bummers happening because sometimes you want to tell a sad story. But, like, I don't want the game to disappoint the players. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. So it's it's kind of it's important to me that the player be an active participant in this conversation. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm glad that that was where that rule took us in this game because mm -hmm. yeah that was my goal basically yeah I, I i love that aspect of this that that it does sort of bring in a little more player consent for things like that like you know it's it's obviously just a difference of play styles but you know you you sit down at some tables and you've got a gm whose goal is to wipe the party you sit down at other tables and the GM is afraid to wipe the party. And there's always a, a happy middle ground between those two points. Uh, but bringing the player's feelings and, and thoughts about it narratively or otherwise to the table, that just makes it a better experience for everyone because everybody knows what they're getting into. Everybody knows mm -hmm. what to expect and, and how things are going to go. And I think this system was sort of built in a way that um, makes it more like cooperative storytelling than a lot of the other games that I would call cooperative mm -hmm. storytelling. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. the, the whole reason I got into tabletop games is for the cooperative storytelling aspect, and this lends itself so perfectly to that, and I love that. Yeah. Um, Hedonism Jesse in chat mentioned that sometimes dying makes the character and that's absolutely why instead of just saying like you don't die at zero I put like like ask the care like, ask the player because like if the player has a strong vision of what kind of death would as you put it make the character then like that's what should happen mm -hmm. <laughs> like because yeah. that's um I don't think that's something the dice can necessarily decide for you. I think if you're really quick on your feet, you can spin the dice's response into something that's narratively satisfying. But I don't think that's something everyone can do. And I think that it's very challenging depending mm -hmm. on what the dice say. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree. Um, at, at, the, at the same time, I, I feel like there's always an argument to be made that there's there's always going to be more to a character's story, especially in a longer form campaign. Uh, it's easy in a game like this, uh, where your your characters don't necessarily have as deep of a, a background, a personal anchor in the world, uh, large scale ambitions to to achieve over the next somewhere between three and twenty levels, however long you decide to play. Um, so there, there's always going to be that nagging question of unresolved character beats, story beats that you that you could go for. Um, so I, I can definitely, s 
it, it it's it's definitely an interesting dynamic of balancing story and building the character whether that's uppercase character or lowercase character whether you're talking numbers or you're talking personality or you're talking long-term goals uh because it, it's definitely a very fine balance which is why i really like games this, this most notably in this one that turns it into a conversation that's what i really like yeah. about uh i mean pat you hit it on the head collaborative uh, cooperative storytelling that is that is the pinnacle of of this hobby to me to to gaming to me this is this is the reason i play with other people as opposed to hopping on my ps4 or, or booting up a, a D, D inspired video game uh it it turns it into a conversation into collaborative storytelling uh and you can have you can you can pause the game and be like you, you can you can talk about what your reasons are your pros and cons for death and have a have a discussion about how how death could be most interesting not only for your character for you as a player but for the the group dynamic the the uh group building group character building exercises and of course for the story uh i know anybody who followed our D D show while we were still doing it there was definitely a couple times where uh either i could have killed a character or i did technically kill a character uh but they did end up surviving returning in some way because mm. you're right there there is always more that can happen and sometimes uh the the death that the dice provided is not the most interesting death that can be had uh, so I, I I really like with this game, and I think doing doing this game and seeing how it how it played out at the end of this last episode really drives home for me that even other games that don't necessarily do it, I think I'm I am going to start adopting this rule as sort of a, a house rule for things going forward. It could be difficult oh, yeah. in some games more than others, but it's that conversation aspect that drives it home for me. Another reason I did it is that because like some people just play for escapism and they get attached to their characters and they just want to be this other self every week. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that mode of play. And I think that like a person who's just playing to escape and who is super attached to their character should get a say in whether or not that character dies. Like, mm -hmm. Even if it's not for, like, grand storytelling appropriate story beats reasons, even if it's not, like, a high-minded reason, sometimes it's just like, I just want to be this character once a week. Mm -hmm. I don't want, I'm not ready to let go of that yet. That's valid, and uh, I think that that's a perfectly fine mode of engaging with role-playing games. Mm -hmm. and that it really sucks when you engage in that mode and your character dies <laughs> yeah yeah and i i think i th we're we're getting a little little tangential to our current conversation but i think that's fine because it, it's very valuable dming discussion um yeah I, I, I feel like that sort of thing is best discussed in a session zero. I am a big advocate yeah. for session zeros, whether whether you need one session zero or three session zeros, whether you spend half an hour before the game talking about things or three weeks before the game talking about things. Uh, it's, it's really good to understand where your players are at because sometimes you get players that do just want to live a different life for a bit and really throw themselves into that character and use that character as escapism or as playing out some some fantasy feeling feeling strong feeling powerful uh expressing themselves in ways that they don't otherwise feel comfortable expressing themselves and that's great uh but that can be antithetical to some groups that are more hardline story forward um and i know i've had to deal with the balance of that before um uh, because I, I I lean more towards the story side of things than necessarily just the uh, I don't know escapism side of things that just wanting to be another because my brain is so fragmented I have hundreds hundreds of characters that live rent free in my brain you you knock off one of them I have a whole line <laughs> waiting to take its place um, so I, I think it's very important to have that session zero and understand where your characters are. And I don't think everybody necessarily needs to be on the same page as long as everybody understands that the bar 
moves sometimes for different players. Because if you have one player that, I have this character in mind, I'm very attached to this character, I have these goals that I really, really want to accomplish, uh, and they they aren't comfortable with character death, uh, it it's a further conversation between you, that player, and the other players at the table as to, well, okay, if... If this player's character dies, if they drop to zero, if they fail their death saves, whatever it is, they're probably going to survive. They have that level of, of plot armor. Uh, is Does everybody want that level of plot armor? If we give it to this person, do we have to give it to everybody? It, people who are more comfortable with death. Uh, it, so it, it's definitely a conversation that you want to have, uh, which is... Which is why I think that having the conversation codified into the rules when it happens is really valuable. It, it's, it's not valuable enough to skip it in the beginning, but it's, it's sort of a, a, a second bookend to that whole conversation that you get to have in the moment. Yeah. Because sometimes things in the moment change. Yeah. Sometimes the character who's really attached, like the player who's really attached to their character for escapism reasons will in the moment be like, actually, you know what? They've accomplished everything they want and this is a good death for them. Okay. Mm -hmm. And like, I think that's a really important and powerful moment, actually. Mm -hmm. And I, I think over the, over the course of a longer form game, that can be difficult to pinpoint. Uh, but definitely for a one-shot or a small form adventure like we had here, uh, I usually do lean towards players, or, or characters, I should say, characters surviving until the end. And then the end comes and all bets are off, which is which is why I, I very pointedly asked before we even started this game, uh, is failure an option? Is death an option? We had a we had an interesting conversation yep. about that, and I I really I really like hearing yes to those questions. Failure is an option. Death is an option if it comes up because that means you're thinking narratively. You're accepting narrative consequences, and it's it's not just I have my character. Don't mess with my character. <laughs> yeah. And of course, you get cool stories like this where. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we we really pushed things all the way up to the end, and it got a, it got a little hairy. <laughs> like we we don't know it, if Doyle survived, and I love yeah, that. Did. <laughs> Cruelty, unkindness in that final fight. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, well, I I went off on a tangent there with my own GM rambling nonsense. Um. S succinct jesse says succinct i'm assuming that doesn't regard me in any way i'm not <laughs> succinct at all uh let's see uh, people should ask themselves why am i here and what do i want to do yeah yeah um yeah, yeah but i i think i think we veered veered off topic enough for that discussion um yeah bring bring us back to to memory time and and to to wrap up of that last episode um so somebody somebody just said something that I wanted to run with, and my brain stopped. <laughs> um, that happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that fight was full of nastiness. That's what it was. That fight was full of nastiness. Uh, I uh, yeah. I I really enjoyed from the G from the GM's perspective watching how all these crises went starting with the first one with the vision and then at the town and then at the at the three-way factional fight and each fight I took something different away from that that I could that I could tweak the next fight for and I I think from from my own GMing side of things uh that really all came together in this final fight because I felt like the prior three crises allowed me to fine tune this last one to really get that that exact razor's edge of teetering teetering on success and failure teetering on you know are the players going to survive are they going to get knocked out or what what's going to happen yeah i feel like you did a pretty good job of making sure doyle was always on that edge <laughs> mm. i think in every encounter doyle doyle was was just barely not quite you know not quite pushed over to 
full scatter or to you know unconsciousness or anything like that mm. but that might be uh because i had doyle uh taking unnecessary risks yeah i think that was more yeah. doyle than me <laughs> yeah <laughs> at least for the at least for the first three crises yeah you and i drove our characters like we stole them mm -hmm. yeah right mm -hmm. yeah very great <laughs> meanwhile don is like no nah. no nah. nah, i'm i'm here to survive i'm not about dying and I thought that that was a really good contrast, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think um, what was really cool is that even though we made all of our, like, characters pretty, like, independently and stuff, like, there was a lot of very interesting, like, narratives to tell in between our Motley trio. Like, there's, like, a lot of good foils. Like, mm. um, I guess, like, unless Marius is, like, scattered, right? Like, he's not... <laughs> he's like, like doyle's the talker of the trio and like you know so then it's like and then it's like yeah like doyle and marius charge in head first and, and like and like are scattering and getting damaged and callus is like i'm just gonna hang back here like we had like a lot of good like playing off of each other's that yeah. i thought really added to everything absolutely i loved i loved pat i loved when doyle sat down and finished breakfast Mm -hmm. in the fourth episode i thought that was that was a good moment i that i was um, <laughs> that was so sweet <laughs> he he wasn't going to interrupt the touching moment between marius and Kalos, but he also yeah. was gonna finish baking breakfast <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah and it just kind of i think it, it was a moment where we really got to see like okay doyle is the person who will quietly get things done in the background for other people mm -hmm without calling yeah. attention to himself and uh i really liked that yeah i think that little scene really did best ex exemplify each of your personalities and how they developed into this group dynamic yeah because you had doyle kind of low-key tending to everything making sure everything was held together uh and then then you had uh, as, as we've seen play off before uh kalos and and uh marius kind of trading off supporting each other or or having issues and supporting each other yeah like marius being uh so focused on other people that he burns breakfast mm -hmm. and doyle just kind of quietly fixing breakfast was uh i we didn't get to see a lot of the dynamic between Marius and Doyle, but that scene really kind of painted such a gorgeous picture of it for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think that um, ultimately that is that is a, a good description of where I think Doyle fit in the the group itself. Anyway, you know, he was. He was the pragmatic one. He was the one that was like, all right, we have already lost this town. And then Marius proved him wrong. Um, mm -hmm. He's the one who climbed down to the well because you guys were dealing with the townsfolk. You guys were, you guys were doing things to help other people. And Doyle was saying, okay, while they're taking care of other people, I'm going to make sure we can still accomplish our goal. Yeah. You know, and and so because Doyle knew that you two had people handled, Doyle could go <laughs> off and and you know, take a well nap. Yeah, <laughs> take a nap at the bottom of a well. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, but but because because you all did such a good job of taking care of people, Doyle didn't have to. Yeah, but at the same time, Doyle was going to make sure he took care of you two. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very heartwarming, very wholesome, very wholesome best friends for sure. Yeah. When did, when did you decide to make Doyle's like whether he lives or dies ambiguous? Like when did that come into your head? Uh, that came into my head in that moment. Uh, you know, I I was. You know, I, I was told Doyle may not survive this. And I was like, okay, I'm okay with that. But I I like the idea that everybody can kind of choose. It doesn't have to be a certain thing. Um, now, 
for for me personally i do like to imagine that he survived i like the idea of him walking in the door behind kalos and getting a letter from marius and you know i i think those are are sweet moments but i also am a little bit biased mm. And, you know, so for, for me, letting everybody else decide what narratively makes the best sense to them, I, I, I like that. Yeah, see, for me, I don't know if Doyle survived. <laughs> <laughs> because I like drama. <laughs> to yeah. me, yeah. it's far more interesting if, uh, if, if Kalos goes home to her family and... Uh, you know, Doyle's not there. There has to be a, a heartfelt grieving moment or, uh, you know, you, you, you all meet up or, or, or for, for whatever, yeah. for whatever reason, uh, some, somebody, we, we see it, we see a letter addressed to Doyle that, uh, that shows up at someone else's house or gets redirected to Kalos or, or another loved one. And it's just, it's, yeah, you have to read. You have to read yeah. a dead person's mail, which is always uh, oof. Yeah, yeah. There's, I mean, I can I can equally see like Doyle walking into Callus's family's place behind everyone else, but I can also see us looking at the painting and seeing Doyle's signature on it mm -hmm. and getting bummed. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and having to explain to like the kids and Callus's parents that we weren't the only ones who painted this, that our friend helped, mm -hmm. but we lost him. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be uh, equally uh, equally poignant, I think. Yeah. And that yeah. could be a good moment for, for Kalos also. You know, I I came back to see my friends and family because I lost a friend. And I don't want to have to lose everyone I grew up with. I don't want them to lose me without knowing the person I grew into during this journey. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it could be a very powerful moment. That is very powerful. Yeah. Now I'm torn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm also torn. Glass no, half full, glass half empty kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What uh, what else did we have? I I think one of the biggest questions I have, um, and one one of the one of the conversations I'm most interested in is what you guys thought about the unit mechanics. And getting getting the the three units that you started off with the ghosts the the legion and the militia uh, and of course the automatons later uh, and and what you thought both narratively and mechanically about the the question of trading those units in for successes. I didn't wanna. I <laughs> didn't wanna do it. Mm -hmm. Not even to the ghosts. <laughs> I, I liked that. Um, I, I think that I think that had it not been for some of those edge successes, we might have used them a little bit differently because mm -hmm. the the way the way at least I was was ordering it was, you know, the most expendable are the automata that never had souls, then the hollow that, you know, are already dead. And then we already knew that the militia was dead no matter what. So they were human, but expendable. And then the Legion. I think that if we hadn't had those edge successes, I would have reversed the order mm -hmm. of those last two. Yeah, that was, that was, the, that was yeah. unfortunately a, a bit of meta information that crept into, uh, you know, how things played out. But I, I think that's more or less fine. Uh, yeah. And I, I think that could definitely translate into the narrative with you guys realizing that you called for a militia and they sent a bunch of boys, <laughs> like like a bunch of yeah. teenage boys who've never who've never uh, been to war. Right? They have they have their grandpa's hand me down armor and weapons. Um, so I'd, I I uh, yeah I I had kind of that moment of inspiration when I came up with that additional rule. You have these you have these units that you can trade in for four successes. And it was definitely there, one, because I knew this was gonna be a nasty fight and I wanted to give you guys some some wiggle room to, you know, get get successes if you if you really need to push uh one one success over the edge or if you really need to tank a specific hit. 
but also and probably more importantly in my mind to make you question those that that moral decision of are you going to sacrifice these people and what what uh the the risk reward aspect of it and where that lies for each of these different these different units and i i think that pretty much did play out yeah i i think that it it comes down to the same question of whether or not we could save that first town um and for for doyle that was simply balancing an equation you know if if we fail here the continent is lost mm -hmm. and so no it's not going to be my first option to trade in these units but ultimately sacrificing them sacrificing ourselves that's a smaller price to pay than the entire continent is taken over by a demonic thorn monster yeah I was like, oh, we had a big discussion about this in the episode, but I think like a big part of Marius's journey is learning to accept that there are other people who are as willing to sacrifice mm -hmm. themselves as he is. And that um, he doesn't need to be the person standing between the darkness and humanity. Like there are other people who will stand there with him. Mm -hmm. And um, so like Marius, however, on an instinctive level, did not want to give any of the units up. Like his instinctive response is I do not want anyone to die here. But um, yeah, it, it took some really serious soul searching, I think for the lad to be like, you know what? They're willing to die. Like mm -hmm. if, if, uh, if I were denied a position on the front lines because <laughs> somebody wanted to keep me alive, I'd be livid. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that conversation um, in, in both uh, in-character and out-of-character sense that we had uh, when it came down to the question of those Ed successes, taking those Ed successes for the militia, was a great character-divining moment for everybody, but I think most especially for Marius, who was initially like, yeah, no way, keep keep those kids at home. And then we looked at your lesson, which you, which you just described, and there was that full 180 that we got to solve, get to see right there in the show. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I, I thought that was another really powerful moment for, for like, you know, I, I've said this in pretty much every after show. You two are just such incredible role players, and that, that just played right into that. You know, you you both played your characters to a T, and, you know, ultimately what this decision came down to is, if not them, then who? Because we certainly weren't weren't gonna walk in there just the three of us and Maud and win. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think Marius trying to get the siege engines for the militia was a uh, kind of a moment where it's like, well, no, he hasn't completely learned his lesson. He's still gonna try to keep them out of the line of fire, <laughs> but mm -hmm. he respects their desire to contribute too much to deny them that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is. I think a good place for the lad to land on that. Yeah. Yeah. The boy, the lad, the child. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah, was was there any particular moment in that last fight, uh, namely when you had to turn in one of those units that uh you, you think back and and you don't think you should have or on the other side of it, you think back and think you know we really could have used that that extra little push i wouldn't have burnt the militia but in <laughs> character marius was not aware it was happening yeah sure because yeah. kalos left to go mm -hmm. do it yeah so like, like i was had to double back happening. to like get them to come out and mm -hmm. like yeah to die for, for as, uh, as a player i agree with the decision to use the militia instead of the the army because we knew the militia was already doomed yeah. yeah but like in character not at all how doyle would have done that and again mm -hmm. doyle didn't know what was going on <laughs> doyle was was on his way to mess with some other world tech that he had no business mess messing with as we found out yeah, uh, no, business. <laughs> no business whatsoever um but at the same time, I don't think that 
Doyle would have tried to stop it had Kalos said something. Yeah, because like, Kalos if, kind of was like... If Kalos told Doyle what the plan was, Doyle probably would have thought about it for half a second and said, all right, I trust your judgment, and kept going. Because, you know, we, ultimately what it comes down to in that moment is a good plan now is better than a perfect plan later. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Callus, I think Callus is like whole narrative story arc in a way was meant to like where she just realized like she doesn't have to be like this. Like like a lot of her lessons were like, what are your boundaries? Like, first off, what are they? And then second off, like remain firm. And I think that, you know, she's not like, we have to save everybody, but she's also like, I don't want the people that I care about to suffer. And so like, it's a bit cruel. And to be fair, she was also incredibly scattered. <laughs> Cause, and, um, but yeah, like it was a very like selfish moment where she was like, I don't care about you and i like like narratively like i don't care about you like i care more about these two people who are on the verge of like collapsing shout out um but like i don't really care and like if it wasn't the militia was gonna be the army like because she's just like why would i want like and like and i think in a way it was like a bit manipulative too where she was like you're here and you're just gonna stay back there where it's like, if you don't act now, like, we're all gonna, like, this isn't gonna get out of hand, and then we're all gonna die, or you could act now and protect the ones that you care about. Like, it was very manipulative, because she was, like, scattered to the point, like, I mean, she had the forest slides, so I mean, she had, like, she wasn't, like, about to collapse at 10, she had, like, two more, right? But it was still, like, at the point where I was like, yeah, like, Kalos is gonna be making, like, very selfish decisions, and in her eyes is like okay like this is what i'm not gonna budge on and i don't care like i don't care what you think about me i mean part of it is like you're gonna be dead but like <laughs> like i don't care like what the people who are living do because this is what i have to like trust myself in this moment that the decision that i came up with is the right decision like i can't mm -hmm. keep outsourcing it to other people to make for them to make the decision for me and so yeah i mean I'd do it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know mean, those are unfortunately leadership qualities that you uh, you kind of have to pick up yeah. with, with varying degrees of stakes, depending on the leadership role you're taking. <laughs> but yeah, def we definitely saw growth in all of these characters in everyone's character. Yeah. It's really fun to see. Mm. It was nice. It was a good time. Mm -hmm. uh... Uh, I will say, though, of course, and I'm sure you guys already know this, if you adamantly were opposed to sacrificing any of these units, I don't know if you would have survived that fight. <laughs> no. We would not have. Yeah. No. I, I can and tell if you, now, you did, have. Mauled wouldn't. <laughs> mean and yeah. cruelty, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think... Um, I did like that that sometimes you laid out the the cost benefit of of different paths like as we were going into this fight you told us that you know redirect was one step harder than outlast mm -hmm. but if we focused on outlast mod was going to take more damage mm -hmm. and it was an easy decision all right we're going all in on redirect mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah Yeah. Uh yeah, this this was a really interesting fight for me to design because it was it was definitely more than just where do I want these numbers to be? Uh because I I did figure destroy if you could manage the 10 successes, which I know is a huge amount of successes. If you could if you could manage that, destroy would take the least amount of time. Uh but probably result in the most casualties on on your side and on the unit yeah. side but would be probably most beneficial to mauled on the other side outlast would prioritize your safety and the unit safety take the longest amount of time risk failure uh, from a from a you know full objective standpoint and probably 
you know, sacrificed Maud, putting putting most of the most of the stress on on them for that fight. And then redirect was right in the middle. Uh, and I'm glad that's where you where you settled on. That's that's where I was hoping you guys were going to settle on because that allows that allows all of us to again that collaborative storytelling aspect of finding where that that teeter totter is as to you know uh, what units are going to what units are going to fall. Will you guys survive? What what's you know how is Maul doing in this whole fight? I wanted to advance destroy, but ten is so many. It's so yeah. yeah, yeah. I was seriously tempted, and if I were to do it again, I would have tried. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, I genuinely want to just go come out. Here's the thing, though: I can cast an eight scatter spell and advance redirect. Mm -hmm. Can't do that with ten. Ten. No. Ten. Yeah. 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 I mean, cows. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. Yeah. I redirect once, I unlock my key, I'm like, alright, I'm, I'm sorry, I destroy once, I redirect, I unlock my key, I'm like, alright guys, I got two, what are y'all doing? Mm -hmm. I, but... I also, um, I, I thought it was interesting that in the final fight, we walked in the least prepared. Mm -hmm. Like, all of the other encounters that we had, we had so much in our base success pool yeah mm -hmm. and then this one we walk in and we're just like we we have enough to automatically advance once yeah yeah and we were like scrambling to add to the success pool mm -hmm. like to the, as well like that was that was rough <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly like, as intended <laughs> right because it was like we were scrambling because it's like not only do we have to advance any category once otherwise like ma's gonna take a mm -hmm. beating but then also it was like not only do we have to do that we also have to focus on um protecting and like not taking these like deadly yeah. blows mm -hmm. we were yep. like well this isn't that good yeah that that was rough <laughs> yeah i i really like with this game that your ability to uh to to well aid in your advancement of these goals is the same pool that you use to stop yourself from being hurt, from taking consequences. Uh, I think that that creates a, a constant evaluation of, you know, offense versus defense versus uh, it, offense versus defense, or or proactive versus reactive, or whether you're going to try to advance a goal, or whether you think no, we we need to hunker down and we need to uh, create a larger advantage pool so we can. Uh, so that we can survive this next round. And I yeah. think that was most exemplified in that last round of this combat, where it came down to a, a, a variable of only, like, one or two dice, and if you didn't get that, like, everything everything would fall apart. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep. And we needed to learn our lesson about uh, not attempting melee. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we, we my tried god. That. Uh. Oh my god. Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah. it's a real easy way for us to just add a couple of dice to the pool each round. We've got multiple turns. No. Yeah. No. Never again. <laughs> We're not. And now that I think about it, this is not a lens through which I've ever thought about it, but I guess in this game, a dedicated melee combatant is kind of a support character. Kind of. Because they can reliably and easily add to the advantage pool in most fights by just yeah. swinging sword at it. And mm -hmm. like, well, the system doesn't make you make anyone say I hit it with my sword. But like somebody who just wants to hit it with a sword is valid mm -hmm. and also kind of a supporter, which is a weird lens through which to view that play style. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the the crisis resolution uh, mechanic in this game is is vastly different from any other combat mechanic, uh, both both in mechanic and in actual narrative playstyle how how it plays out than I've seen in pretty much any other game. It's fantastic. Yay! Oh, I'm glad. It um, I used to have one that was a lot closer to Dungeon Dragon with a structured initiative, and you would like um every attack had a way that you could interact with it and kind of jump to that initiative and prevent the attack but it wound up being 
fiddly and it was also mm-hmm. just a bummer to run and to mm-hmm. write combat for and i hated it yeah and then one day i got a 2 a.m text from uh kathleen the editor of sort of symphonies and i got it at 4 a.m and i'm not sure either of us were not inebriated at the time that the message was sent or received but it was like hey we already have a mechanic that's similar to this why don't you repurpose it into the new combat mechanic and at 4 a.m i was like yeah this is genius i'm going back to bed and then (laughs) and that was kind of the genesis of this and i'm so grateful to kathleen for sending me that 2 a.m text (laughs) Mm. i was like i i actually enjoy writing and running combats in this new system which i Mm. could not say for the old one yeah, you, you can get really bogged down in games that are constantly a, a back and forth ladder of keeping track of who exactly goes when and strict, uh, you know, move action, bonus action, reaction, full action, half action. Uh, you, you can move 30 feet, you can move 45 feet. This takes a full action. This is a swift action. It's it's just it, I I the more I play games like this especially with newer people the um, again the more i fall back on it being a conversation collaborative storytelling more than spreadsheet management and and calculus and whatnot um i i think it's i think it's very interesting how it plays out uh, in that it it does kind of blend a little bit of it it does definitely blend a little bit of of meta consideration in what you're doing in crisis management because yeah, yeah, yeah. you you know that you have your block of actions where all of you get to do things and then you need to survive its block of actions which can be anywhere between one two attacks to like three four five attacks that you have to try to survive so it's it's that constant reevaluation of offense versus defense uh which which is in this instance i think can blur the line between in-game and out-of-game consideration yeah. And I, I think I think that's good. And I, I, I can definitely see that uh, the, the inspiration you keep bringing up uh, again, JRPGs and whatnot. When I when I think of this, I think of that bar at the top of the screen where you see each where each person's action is and can plan out ahead of time oh, what everybody's yeah. doing. You know, when, once this person goes, the enemy goes after that. So this person here needs to buff this person or <laughs> that, that that sort of thing. Yep. And you can have yeah. those considerations and especially the second player action when you've seen some of the abilities that the enemy can do you realize the one-two punch that is coming at you you then again have to completely reevaluate and be like we can't survive that again we need to make sure we have this amount in the in the advantage pool but we still need to survive so we still need to keep doing everything uh and that was the inspiration for this last fight constantly having to reevaluate how many successes you needed in the advantage pool yeah Yeah. That that came through absolutely in that encounter design, I think, because that was our key question, which is like, do we have enough? Also, we do need to be constantly using it because it's going to get bad if we don't make mm-hmm. decisive actions every turn. Uh, that was a really excellent choice. There, there was At a first, real risk that Maud was going to take that five damage and just go down because yeah. those those were, I mean... Uh... Destroy ten, redirect eight, outlast seven. Yeah, you you could just blow a spell and accomplish one of those goals, but you can really only do that once. Yeah, you you guys did a time it right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very true. <laughs> which uh, which which we did see, I believe. You guys did a really good job of pacing out those successes. It's- um, with the combat system, I used to be a little concerned about how metagamey it was, but now I consider it a feature, not a bug, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. Uh, I had a cat's cradle with the team. I just re-listened to it actually recently, where um, Nick was discussing when you're playing D&D in a large group and you go on your turn and you miss, or like the encounter does something that causes you to lose a turn, like mm-hmm. incapacitates you or something like mm-hmm. that, you're out. Yeah. You go mm-hmm. sit in the corner, go make yep. yourself a sandwich. But in games that have a lot of meta considerations, the player is still part of the conversation, mm-hmm. even if the character is wrapped mm-hmm. in vines or knocked mm-hmm. out. Again, yeah. collaborative storytelling built right yeah. in. Yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it. To, to, to piggyback on that, um, 
you know, uh, being able to have that talk above the table really gets it gets everyone a lot more involved in combat in in more meaningful ways. Mm -hmm. Like something I do isn't going to affect whether or not you all can do whatever you're planning. Um, and we're able to discuss that ahead of time. Whereas, you know, in, in, we, we keep going back to, to D and D because, you know, obviously it's, it's whatever the knows. giant in the industry. Uh, but you know, um, I don't know that, you know, the Druid is planning on, on, turning into an allosaurus and and attacking something <laughs> uh, maybe speaking from experience here so <laughs> when when i you know when i lure it away it's because i don't know what the other the, the rest of the team's plan is mm -hmm. you know it's it's something where you can easily step on each other's toes mm -hmm. and especially when you're working with a group that maybe hasn't played together all that much things like that being able to talk mm -hmm. above the table about it and and being able to sort of coordinate what we're going to do with our spells and our scatter and things like mm -hmm. that is is i think a, a very good feature for for things like this you don't end up with one person standing alone surrounded by enemies because everybody else had already planned on moving away and doing something else <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I think that's a that's an excellent sort of segue into the discussion of uh and and we'll keep coming back to this. What 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 player is going to get the most out of this game? Because with a system like this, it prioritizes, it facilitates players who it how how should I say this? Uh the game assumes, because of the mechanics, because of it being collaboratively built at at the scene that you guys have traveled together you have tactics that you that you that just come innately because you understand each other that because you are in sync you know what your abilities are you can work together as a team it prioritizes feeling important as a team where i think uh in a game like Dungeons and Dragons, where it is much more singularly based, it you can get more stories that are more about learning to work together and struggling mm -hmm. to work together and stepping on other people's toes and having to negotiate how that works out in combat. And then after combat, with that blowout between the fighter and the druid, like, I was going to do this. Well, I didn't know. Well, you need to communicate. Well, you need to communicate. <laughs> and you get this whole blowout, which you don't, which you could get in heroic chord but that's something you have to negotiate at the time it's not something that comes up necessarily uh reactionarily so it, two very different play styles i would say so if you're more interested in a game about uh struggling the, the struggle between individual dynamics and team dynamics uh the D, &D combat might be more your thing but if you're more interested in the playing playing through a well-oiled team and seeing just how awesome and incredible it can be when everything works together if you if you want to play a team if you want to be the avengers if you want to be the justice league or some other comic book superhero team that i'm pulling out of nowhere because i don't know comic books if you want to be a, a well-oiled tactical machine that knows each other that knows what they're doing and has proper team dynamics already built in this is a great game yay yay huh? i think um i think there's there's room for learning to play as a team, but I think it requires like that being a goal of the party. It requires yeah. exactly what we saw, most yeah. notably between Marius and, and Kalos. Because like we could have taken a moment where Marius maybe made a poor tactics role, mm -hmm. and we could have been like, after the combat, been like, "What were you thinking?" Right. Mm -hmm. Because the rule not being good was indicative of the tactics not working out to our best advantage. Mm -hmm. But our goal wasn't to tell a story about learning to work together or a story right. about uh, people who don't accept one another's failures. Right. But I think, like, 
yeah you do have to set out to have that conversation it's something you have to That's work towards in this game whereas it's the flip yeah. side of the coin in other systems like dnd where you have to really really have to work at uh the team dynamic to tell a well-oiled team-based story without it being yeah. overly laden in meta discussions and yada yada yeah that's correct yeah so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, little, and again, little bit of tools discussion in uh in this recap or this uh this memories time yeah and and again i i don't want to necessarily like trash talk D D or or any other system for this there there are different styles for different people mm -hmm. it, it's just you know it, it is the easy comparison because it's the one that I think most people are mm. going to be familiar with. And and I can pull from experience of being frustrated with players that I'm less familiar with their play style and, mm. and sort of seeing, seeing that, that the team grows together, like that's always something that's great. And, and I don't want to leave anyone with the impression that like, I'm going to get mad at somebody if they do the wrong thing in combat or any nonsense like that. Like, obviously, it's still a fun game. It's just a different play style. Yeah. And it's yeah, about how you that, approach that's the, the story. only point I'm trying to make here. I'm not yeah. saying don't play D&D &D or that it's bad or that different play styles mm -hmm. are bad or anything like that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, when, when talking rules, tools, and themes, I, I do tend to stay away from the term pros and cons because I, I don't, I, I mean, I I don't I don't want to present anything within this system as a con within the system. I think everything here is great, but not every game is for every player. Not every system is for every group. So it's important to point out if you're looking for one thing, you might not find it here, but that that's fine because if you're looking for what this game does, it does it so incredibly well. I assume that all resonates Yay. with you. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! I'm I'm really glad to hear it. Yeah. I I want to do what I set out to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. It sounds it, it's a tautology a little bit, but it's uh it's true I think. And um, here's the thing: I'm an indie designer. If there's anything that unites indie designers, it is dunking on Dungeon Dragon. Sorry, it's what <laughs> we do. It's our favorite thing. Yeah. And we love it even more than we like writing our own games. Um, <laughs> sometimes to our detriment. But um, I think it's because also a jumping off point for a lot of indie designers is playing Dungeon Dragon and being like, I want to make one of these. Right. And so analysis of Dungeons and Dragons and the choices it makes is like the springboard that a lot of indie designers, especially ones my age, took. Mm. Nowadays, you have people who get into indie design through other games or other indie games. Um, and that's wonderful and beautiful, and I love to see it. But people my age, most of us started with Dungeon Dragon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, if you look at D and D and you say, you know, I wish we could do it this way. There's another game that does it that way. Just you know, find yeah. that game, learn it, play it. Uh, I know that can be difficult. Time finding people who share the same interests. Uh, you know, breaking down rule books. I can help with the first and the second of those. Finding people to help play the game for you or or with you. Uh, not so much I can do there. But you know, I I the point of RPGs uncovered is of course to help with the time and the difficulty of learning a new game, yeah. uh, which I I think is definitely doable. Obviously, and it's it's <laughs> a beautiful goal that you have, and I'm very I'm I'm delighted by it genuinely, and I'm delighted for Heroic Chord to be part of this mm -hmm. uh, this channel's. Mm -hmm storied history of this library of indie rpgs yeah. which is really lovely but i also think that if you play D D and you think i wish it was done this way maybe you're an indie designer <laughs> oh yeah and you're converting people now <laughs> you, you know all those homebrew maybe rules you, you came up with is, yeah maybe what you want to do is write a game that does that yeah and that's fun. Like, that's fun to do. I've been doing it for a long time. I love mm -hmm. doing it. It's fun. Yeah. My The first ever game I worked on was because my friend came up to me one day in high school and was like, Kat, I had a dream. And I'm like, what? Oh. And he, and he was like, Kat, I had a dream that uh, that 10 strength was plus 10, not plus zero. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> it was a prophecy. And he was like, I'm going to make this game. And I'm like, Okay, good luck. 
And then uh, a couple months later, it was like, Cat, help me play test my game. And I was like, okay. And then from there, <laughs> I just like, I got super into play testing. I got super into design. I helped with the game. Like, mm -hmm. but it started with a dream about a way that he didn't like what D&D &D did. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's how people go on this path, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that that's not just that's not just indie games. I I like to focus on indie games because I like supporting people who are making their own stuff. Uh, and I, I and I think especially nowadays, uh, this this is the cyberpunk coming out in me. But big corporate gaming industries coming down on their writers and their playtesters and and quality assurance and and whatnot. It's just I mean, big corporate and all that. Go play yeah. cyberpunk. You'll get it. Um, <laughs> But but indie designers, that's that's usually the flip side of things. Because if you talk to a, a solo indie designer or a small team, they're like, I wish we had more support so I could support others more, so I could pay people. So I so I could yeah. pay people more for the stuff that they do, so I could pay other people to get more stuff in here. Uh and it it's not it's it's not like I I only want to pay people one or two cents per per word or on on yada yada. A, a lot oh, of indie yeah. designers resonate with other creators, other designers, other artists, other musicians, and it 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 can be just this big happy web of working together. Un unfortunately, we also still need the money to be able to do that. <laughs> I, I think yeah. that's that's true for a lot of industries too. Like where there's just there's not enough support for um for new growth uh a, a while back i got it in my head that i was going to write a graphic novel but i can't afford to pay an artist so i've got uh i've got chapter after chapter written mm -hmm. i've got storyboards laid out but i have no artistic ability beyond stick figures on a storyboard and i cannot afford to pay someone to put in the work that I would require to make this something that's actually worth publishing. So mm -hmm. it's going to sit in my closet for until I have uh, some lucky break winning the lottery or the publisher's clearinghouse or something. Yeah. 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 And it's like, I would love to do a big, flashy, hardcover, fully illustrated release of Heroic Chord, but like, I'm, a, I'm an okay artist. By the, I'm capable of doing an art. I illustrated the the recent manual, but that's not what I mean. What I mean is like a big flashy D and D style pictures of people mm -hmm. locked in combat with demons, and that's that's beyond my capabilities. Artwork is expensive. I want it bad. Artwork oh, it is real yeah. expensive. And and artists deserve to be paid for their work yeah. just as yeah. much 100%. as writers do, just as much as any other creators do. And so yeah. like, I. I don't have it in me to like try and ask someone to do this for free. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I'll, or I'll, or for the yeah. promise of if I get paid later, I will pay right. you. Yeah. Right. That also just doesn't no. I'll hand paint before I'll take mm -hmm. an offer like that to an artist. Yeah. I know I was I'll... sitting on on this idea for RPGs uncovered and getting into streaming in general for a for a long time, years, because I really wanted to start off with character art with music with battle maps with animated intros and uh unless you have literally a few thousand dollars laying around to throw into a capital investment and hope you make it back to continue doing later seasons you're not going to be able to start out that way but i i mean I, I keep saying when i when i do my opening spiel about our support sites i would love to work with other people i would love to pay other people support other people for yeah. those things and uh i mean i've, I've seen other other shows that have character art and animated trailers and whatnot and they get a lot more attention than those who don't unfortunately uh but i i don't have the uh the disposable income to be able to float that and that's, we've gotten yeah. way off topic we, we have, have. <laughs> well yeah but we're talking about how to make game and now yeah now we're in cats cat's very favorite land admin side of things game yeah, yeah. <laughs> love it happy yeah. as a clam well, like, uh, where, where should we be? Uh, where where should we be? I mean, that, mm. that's that's a good point. Uh, I mean, do you do you guys have any th before? Let me just ask: Do you guys have any any other questions? Any other big moments you want to draw out from this last episode in particular? 
or if there's any any big moments, any big questions, any big conspiracies for the the whole arc. I really liked that Maud was Dargan. Mm -hmm. I mentioned yeah. this briefly, but they're my babies. They're my beloved children. They're my favorite creatures in Amilta. So I was very happy that one was part of this story. I, I, I was love. worried in that first episode when I when you guys marched up to the yurt, or, or or not even before you got to the yurt, when you when you went into the tavern and started asking about this oracle, and they were like, "Yeah, they live up there on that on that plateau." And I was worried, Cat, you were going to be like, "They dragon." <laughs> Story yeah. over. Yeah. But like I have I have non-binary NPCs and sort of symphonies who right. are colloquially dragons, but not mm -hmm. literally. But I also have some that are literally literally dragons. So like I I, I, I get so I nervous by that. dropping little hints. Cause if you go back and watch, there's definitely little yeah. hints sprinkled in all over the place. And I get so nervous dropping those because there's usually that one player who is like that, that's it, I got it locked on. Oh my god. But sometimes they don't always say it, but mm, it's always a danger. I, lo I love Kathleen. Uh, Kathleen is our editor on Sort of Symphony. She's mm -hmm. also our composer. She writes beautiful music for our podcast, and she's an amazing player to boot. But Kathleen has my freaking number. She can read my mind. She's like, we'll be doing a combat, and she'll be like, no, we need six in the pool because Kat's about to do that one attack. And I'm like... Why? Mm -hmm. Uncalled for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, and I love that Kathleen is so in tune with the small hints I drop. It's really beautiful. But wow, playing with a character who has you figured out is <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> a lot to deal with. Mm -hmm. I try to be as enigmatic and contradictory as I can, which yeah. I know my D and D party can fully attest to. <laughs> yeah. I, I realize when they catch on to things and I'm like, all right, I'm changing up my, my cues. <laughs> like, I just, I just love Dargan. I just think yeah. they're very mm -hmm. sweet. They're just sweet noodles who can take whatever shapes. They have to learn new shapes, mm -hmm. but they can take them. And they don't know a lot about people. And sometimes they're curious about people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they like people. I, I, I really enjoyed reading that section of the rule book about dragons and and getting that from that because before i read that yeah maud was just going to be uh a wailing arcanist she was just going to be yeah. a regular wailing arcanist and she was going to get visions like uh agrippina was going to speak to her and uh you know all of that and then i read dragons and like this is way more interesting <laughs> <laughs> oh i'm so glad you went that route they're my they're my precious children. I actually wrote a micro game called Dragons of Amilta in which you play baby dragons trying to learn new shapes. Mm, that's great. <gasps> it's adorable. That's it's so adorable. cute. We should do a one shot. I haven't like I haven't done anything with it, but I do have the rules. I will play a one shot with you all. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Call me anytime. Yeah. Yes. Uh my biggest worry with making Maud a dragon though, what I was worried it might order shadow you guys, or you guys might feel like I was trying to steal the spotlight from your characters and shine it more on an NPC. It's something you've always no. got to be careful about. I, I didn't I didn't really feel like that was the case in that final battle. Like it, it was still very much, you know It was very much us. Yeah. 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 My um my concept for Marius's letter to Maud was mostly like, I hope you haven't forgotten this, but you are a dragon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't forget that you are a dragon. <laughs> you seemed oh worried God. that you would forget, so I thought I would write you a letter to remind you. Oh, sweet. I like, <laughs> among other things, but like one of the things he was going to write to Maud was just like, hey, in case you've forgotten who you are, this is who you are. You're a dragon who has done a great deal for humanity. And um, I thought, like, it was very fun playing Marius and getting to know and like Maud a great deal. Um, Because he's kind of awkward around strangers. But the more we hung out with Maud, the more he was like, no, this is my friend. This is someone who's okay for me to, to talk to. And to to reach out to. So I really enjoyed that. I think that's part of why he was so chill about Maud being... Well, partially he was distracted. 
uh why he was so chill about mod being dragon but part of it was just like no this is my friend my friend just happens to be dragon shaped that's yeah. all yeah nothing wrong with that yeah I really like that you guys latched on to Maud, each of you with different reasons and different concerns and different <laughs> conspiracies, uh, because it, it was definitely the other side of that pendulum. I didn't want Maud to overshadow you guys, overshine you guys, but I also didn't want them to just sink into the background, uh, because they were always, when it was crisis time, they were always in the background just doing their own ritual sort of thing. They weren't active participants. Um, they weren't necessarily making decisions for you guys. They would, they would, I, I really like that you guys reached out to Maud and did role play with with them and looked to guidance or 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 bounced all of Maud's weird scattery nonsense took took that from from them bounced it amongst yourself threw it back and then all collaboratively came up with some some interesting <laughs> way to go <laughs> Because Maud yeah. very easily could have just been a plot device in the background that just came up. Oh, you have a vision. She is a vision machine. But she felt a lot more than just a plot device here. Yeah. Which which I think is probably even more on you guys than it is on me. <laughs> I'd like, uh, Doyle's suspicion uh, kind of contrasted with Marius's well-meaning awkwardness. Mm -hmm. It's like they were both keeping Maud at arm's reach, but Marius for his own reasons and Doyle for suspicion reasons. Um, Kalos seemed vaguely resentful of Maud for getting us tangled up in this. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was a really interesting touch as well. I, I just like, still I love that moment. <laughs> I just still love that moment in the second episode, I believe, when Kalos was like, yep. okay, I need Nepho right now. Uh, let me help you off, frail... <laughs> frail scattered lady uh and she just she springs right off <laughs> you yep. could have done that anytime why are you on there yeah yeah like oh because you offered it i was like wasn't that the right thing to do sorry i was supposed to be like hey you, you didn't you didn't offer you told them to get on nepho <laughs> yeah like, all right because that was that was the right thing to do yeah. like uh, yeah. in in their in uh Kalos's mind she was like yeah like they went through this harrowing experience like nepho's right there like get Realistically, on though mod probably only needed nepho for like an hour and that would have been fine <laughs> yeah I, I i really i really like playing up that juxtaposition of of sort of frail mental state but they're still a dragon <laughs> yeah they they can like you you guys get tired after eight hours of walking they're they're just fine oh you need to you need to rest oh okay sure yeah like i said little hints sprinkled in here and there yep. i i I loved the tin full hat polishing coming off of doyle though like what is she doing yeah. what are they doing yeah they're absorbing what, power what, they're the big bad oh no eating hearts <laughs> that are made of thorns it's a problem i i i there, there is nothing I enjoy more. I mean, I'm being facetious here, but there is nothing I enjoy more <laughs> as, as a GM uh, than than faulty big bad accusations. <laughs> They're the big bad. They're it. I know it. Nope. <laughs> no, you don't. Something I enjoy. I, I was glad to. It be means my redirection is working more. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was very glad to be wrong about Maud. Yes. Um, yeah. The the fact that Maud was an ally in the end made yeah. sense, and I liked that much better than oh look at that, Maud did steal the power of a noble demon, and that's going to be somebody else's problem because this was a four episode season. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. I thought that was like Maud's going to shake that demon's hand and then absorb and i was like well like peace yeah. we're good mm -hmm. hey i have a question because yeah. i have uh, i am virtually certain that you have this in your notes who are mod's parents uh dwelling agrippina and wandering hector <laughs> which again little crumbs yeah yeah she referenced yeah. both of them multiple times you're right. Oh. Absolutely right. I took the oh, references yeah. to Agrippina because that was back when I thought she was an arcanist. But because uh, dragons and Amilta are made from the magical pull between two gods, mm -hmm. they just kind of appear. Mm. That's why they have stretched out noodle shapes. 
is because they're made of this magical pulling, like taffy, but magic. <laughs> Aww. Magic so, dragon like, taffy. They're asexual and a gender because they don't reproduce sexually. They don't reproduce. They're just kind of made. But the Daleths on either end of that pull are their parents. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Hector and Agrippina is a neat pair of parents. Yeah, yeah. I, I had fun. I had fun with that one. I definitely want to do a write-up of... Uh, you know, just, just what went into making them. And I, it was, it was definitely a desire of mine in coming up with the overall story arc of this, and especially Mauled, uh, to create something that you could, you could look back, or if you needed to, you could go back and watch again and be like, oh, I get it. Is Dargan, yeah. Because is I, I, sure is I do think if you go back. Especially having having either played through this yourselves or from the from an audience perspective, go back and watch it again, which I know is a whole like 16, 17 hour thing. You don't need to do it. But if, if you did, I, I'm sure you would notice little crumbs like, oh, yeah, clearly there were always a dragon. Oh, why does she keep mentioning Hector and, and Agrippina? Uh, yeah. what, what's going on with all of these vines here and there and creatures moving about? all over the place uh yeah like I'd... the the very suddenly not appearing disheveled wasn't uh wasn't cleaning up it was just changing into a less disheveled shape yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> like good on them. how that happened so fast yeah <laughs> but now mod's a shapeshifter so yep yeah <laughs> and of course i'm sure you realized at this point it wasn't Maud's Maud was not a descendant of the original Rose Warden. Maud yeah. is the Rose Warden. They just kept taking new shapes to appear human. For the comfort of others or for the secrecy of their identity. Either way, yeah. that <laughs> makes sense. Yeah. True. And then eventually uh, they got confused and forgot that they weren't human. Yeah. And and I mean probably and and I should say actually, uh the the getting confused and believing they were human probably came sooner than later because the the breaking of the world the the cataclysm the melting of the cloud comb the demons coming out did did kind of break Maud a little bit <laughs> because that's a big event to live through and a big event to be forewarned about and have to have to yeah. you know save people from right because uh, because again that was that was messages coming straight from Agrippina who is who is kind of an oracle deity themselves and Hector who is you, you know uh, the wanderer the wanderer yeah the wanderer take these people have them wander lead them to a safer place the the uh the the prophet or the the oracle and the and the deliverer sort of sort of uh, yeah. pair that's very good. The other thing that is really interesting for me, for me, from the from the perspective of the person who wrote the lore and knows all the lore, is that the person who is most suspicious of Maud is the person who is most likely to have encountered a dragon before. <laughs> Which was very... I don't know, uh, Pat, if you read all of the lore? <laughs> I, I did. I read through, I read through all of yeah. the lore. I just... I. I didn't put the pieces together that Maud would be a dragon. Yeah. I, I missed the clues. Uh, in <laughs> hindsight, it's obvious. But, you know. Pat, I'm talking about Doyle. Mm -hmm. because, yeah, like, yeah. Doyle may have interacted with a character called the Shadow Monarch, yep. who is the leader of the Old Capital, who is the primary force standing between Pilgrims and Beckoning Atosa. And the shadow monarch is an ancient dragon and Atosa's best friend and the only non-human ranger that exists is the shadow monarch but like most people who see the shadow monarch just see kind of like a weird jerk who lives in the city so like it's it's almost it's very likely that doyle has encountered this weird jerk and just was never made aware that they were a dragon. Yeah. And then has yeah. encountered another weirdo who was a dragon. It's just <laughs> I, I liked that. Mm -hmm. On on mm -hmm. my on my first draft of of Doyle's character sheet, I had written down that um that he had tea with the Shadow Monarch. Oh, I 
that. I like that a lot. <laughs> You're really funny. That's really good. I would I like that yeah. a lot. I, I love hidden dragons. I love it. I love them too. I always have. My favorite thing about D&D dragons was the fact that they could shape shift into people. Mm -hmm. And so you'd you'd have it. You'd ha always have a GM when I was a kid who couldn't resist having an NPC secretly be a gold dragon. Oh, yeah. And oh, that was just you have that to. was just classic. It's it, exactly. It was irresistible to me. It was irresistible to my friends is kind of my most the most compelling thing about them in D&D &D to me. Mm -hmm. So, of course, I had to write something like that into my own game. I mm -hmm. had to. I love them. Uh, but at the same time, in all the years I've spent running D&D, I've never actually thrown a dragon at at my players. Uh, not 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 a not a dragon that they've had to fight, and not even an obvious dragon that they had to work with. Have my players been tricked into working with dragons under cover of or under guise of being regular people? Certainly, uh, but they've never mm. actually encountered an actual dragon in dragon form before. Uh, so Ooh. as a nice little little quip, little uh, little rib jab to to D and D. I'm going to try to throw dragons into as many of these RPGs on cover series as I can. I just love them. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. I just love them. We had, we had a dragon in, uh, in Veil of the Void. We had a dragon in this one. We'll see what I can come up with in, uh, in future seasons. Maybe that's being part of like making indie games, just always having <laughs> yeah. dragons. Take if that, D&D. &D. If we do a one shot of dragons of Amilta, we'll have a party of baby dragons. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's so good. I love that. Yeah. I put the rules in the chat, by the way. <laughs> cool, 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 cool. <laughs> but so that's um, I just love them. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think they're neat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but I, I think that last point again is a great segue into another discussion of uh, is this game for you? And one of the again, I don't want to say pro or con but one of the things that is very ingrained into this game is the setting uh the the setting of this game is in my mind integral with with playing the game uh you get your powers from the daylith so you need to have the daylith's or your rangers don't make sense and you you your rangers as part of the backstory as part of how they are rangers had to go to where the daylith's are so you need to know where each of the Daleths are located, or at least your particular Dalith is located, what that site is like, what you had to go through, what your ordeal was to become a ranger, how you got there. Uh, so the, the lore of the game is really quite ingrained in the actual understanding and play of the game. I don't think it's overbearing, though. There's a lot of games out there that have a ton and ton and ton of lore, and you have whole maps that you have to... Like, I, I know I've never played an actual Forgotten Realms game of D&D because it is too much, too much lore to have to parse through. I will make my own. It will be far easier for me to just make my own. It will make way more sense to me. Um, but I don't feel like that's something you can you can do to the same level with Heroic Chord because you need to know who your rangers are, who they got their power from, and what they had to go through. On the other side of things, the map that you provide is so expansive but it's it's not littered with dots here and there it has the big capital events where all of the daylists are and a few little points of interest here and there but i mean i created rose rest i created yep. uh this this in in thorned city and it's somewhere in the central of the Velt. Uh, so you can definitely make your own stuff. There is there is definitely plenty of leeway for creating your own crises, of course, your own items, which, uh, which I showed with the flower and the shield, uh, your own NPCs, your own areas, but you do still need to have at least a baseline foundational understanding of the lore for things to make sense for your story and most importantly for your characters. And I did write uh, an SRD, which is like the mechanics of Heroic Chord with the with the lore stuff and mm -hmm. the specifics stripped out. So if you really wanted to use this, like this combat resolution mechanic, but you wanted mm -hmm. to tell a cyberpunk story, you can look up Harmony Drive and build a cyberpunk version of this mm -hmm. with the Harmony Drive system. It is. Oh, look at that face. Look at that thinking face. <laughs> it's um yeah you can find it on my itch it's free mm -hmm. it's so 
yeah, but there there are definitely tools. Is, yeah, mm -hmm. heroic court is very much kind of meant to take place in a milta. Yeah, because I like. Uh, I think I mentioned this in the beginning intro, but I really like stories that feel connected to the land mm -hmm. and feel connected to the landscape. And so I think for this game, especially, I wanted to write a landscape mm -hmm. and build a game around it. And it's exactly as we've been uh, advertising on, on Twitter and on, on Discord. This is a pastoral fantasy TTRPG. And in order for it to be pastoral, for it to be about the exploration of the land, you kind of need to know what that land is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. at least foundationally and then you can go out and explore it create your own things put your own waypoints on the map and whatnot but you still need to know what a melta is and what's most important to the setting uh and of course you can go check out the srd you can check out other uh games that cat made but if you're looking to play heroic chord you have to take the time to read some of the lore in the background but again that's not overwhelming uh, because if we look at the table of contents, you get pretty much everything you need in the Welcome to Amelta section of the book for anyone following along, which starts on page 104 and ends on page 121. So that's, what, 17 pages uh, yeah. of, of information? Uh, you know, with margins and, and with formatting and with font size and whatnot. And it's all engrossing. I, I, I read through Aww. all of that nonstop. It's great stuff. Uh, but, but you I'm have so that bad. there. Uh, and then you have the information in each of these specific, um, uh, classes, playbooks, whatever you want to call them. You have little tidbits of information there. And really, especially if you have an, if you have an idea in mind already, as to what kind of character you want to play, you can look at, okay, I want to play a volcanic tracker, and you can focus on just that lore of the volcanic tracker. Or from the GM side of things, you can think, okay, I, I want this story to be about uh, about the the evils of of expansion and and land grabs and all all of that and 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 a story about people being displaced and, and whatnot. You, you can focus on little pieces of information. You can skim over things and be like, hey, Hector really resonates with me like, right now. Let's, let's read up on that. And you can kind of pinpoint exactly what you need. So even if you're not interested in reading 17 pages of lore, which really isn't a lot in the grand scheme of things, you can, you can kind of skim and, and have ideas of your own and, and really pinpoint what you need. Yay! And I, I really enjoyed it. My, I'm so glad to hear it. Really enjoyed my reading it. My style is typically, is typically pretty brief. That's just mm -hmm. my writing style is typically uh, yeah. a little on the direct side, which yeah. I think when you're writing TTRPGs is, is a blessing because it means you can put, like, you can make it so that the lore is important to your game without making that as much of a burden as it could be. I hope yeah. that's my yeah. goal anyway. I know I know I've looked at other rule sets and you get to the lore side of the rules and it's like reading through a history textbook. There's dates uh. and numbers and all kinds of names that you have to cross reference all over the place and timelines and it it it, it like a hundred pages of information all spread out in different chapters that you have to reference back to. It's just too much. Uh it could be really interesting if that's what you're looking for. If that's what you're looking for, go check out Forgotten Realms. But if you want something that is brief, but highly evocative, uh, but also integral to the setting, again, Heroic Court is where you're at. Yay! Uh, let's see. What, uh, what else can we talk about here? Um, I have a question. Yeah. How helpful did you find the encounter building guidelines in the book? Oh, I loved it. Because oh, it was so oh, helpful. So oh, it was great. Um, I I really wanted to make this a book that a person could pick up and run a game in confidently. Yeah. So that's that that's kind of been a stress point for me. It was mm -hmm. like, could a stranger run this game? Yeah. And so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean Yay. that's uh, I mean that's kind of what I did. Yeah, uh, ran some extremely cool encounters. <laughs> I love you. that. Thank yeah, uh, yeah, I I really enjoyed the encounter building section, and it was definitely very helpful. Definitely very helpful Good. because this is a very different way of building encounters than what I'm used to from a D and D perspective. Because you're not just building from 
you know, the players have this to hit bonus and they do this much average damage and it needs to last this number of rounds to be interesting. And then uh, this CR enemy will have this AC. Is that appropriate to the two hit bonus? If if they do 30 damage per hit, how many hits should they have per per turn before they just start wiping out party members and you get into the death spiral? Uh, whereas, whereas this system, again, facilitates and supports and really almost requires that you think about crisis in a non-combat overall landscape because combat destroy is only one third of how you could go about resolving crisis and i really i really like that it that it's termed crisis revolu resolution resolving a crisis as opposed to combat because that that evokes two very different things. If I if I said at the beginning of all of these crises, everyone roll initiative, it's time for combat, it would have had a very yeah. different feel. And I know, like, oh, sorry. Did no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just thinking, like, we didn't ever advance destroy. Like, we didn't like that. Wasn't like we advanced destroy, oh, but we didn't, we didn't like we didn't. We didn't that wasn't the resolution. Anything. We didn't destroy anything. Yeah. Like we yeah. like, like you're talking about combat. I'm like we were more leaning towards redirect our outlast like i was going through and trying to make yeah. sure and i was like as you're talking I was like for all the talk about combat and destroy like it really was like such a we just chose other i guess more narratively mm -hmm. interesting at the time that, that's like the ticket options there. because yeah. in the second episode uh a town of tangle when when you went to the town uh, destroy was the easiest of those options. Uh, it had it had a had a destroy of five, and I believe you guys went with a redirect, which was the highest of those options, with a with a difficulty of eight uh, to Didn't advance the goal. Hurt the yeah. Didn't want to hurt the people. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So you elected for the much more difficult option because of because of how you wanted the narrative pro to progress, which I from from a from a storyteller's perspective i adored that from somebody trying to show off the game and what going down the destroy route would look like i was a little concerned because you're right we never really did show off destroy as a as a full uh you know advanced right. pathway which is why i started adding little different uh crisis actions that would force you to destroy every now and then <laughs> oh it looks like we advanced destroy in the third episode Oh, yeah, I think we advanced it, but we never like yeah. Yeah. hived it. Yeah, uh, we, we like advanced we it, once. it according to my notes. Oh, we did. Uh, oh shoot, never mind. Did you, did you, did you. And I'm trying to I'm trying to remember whether the creeping tangle three in my notes means the third session that I had on this stream or the third gameplay session. I, I, I think, think the third gameplay session. I think because the... the spell pieces were home people debris tangle content and pierce. The oh, town thought... of Tangle, I think. Oh, we just was, did we destroy we destroy it? destroyed. Uh, but but before we could, I got so focused it, on the yeah freed the people. Yeah, I got so focused on that. Oh, yeah. okay. wait, I'm that was where I used uh, yeah. ruin Tangle and had the mm -hmm. the vines wither and die away. Yeah. That really only makes sense as destroy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, it just yeah. felt like such a <laughs> or like an like a yeah. redirect slash island because we were advancing we weren't like let's burn this town to the ground we were mm -hmm. like let's just get to the well the source and then you chuck yeah. the yeah. so it was destroy okay okay yeah. thank you no, that, yeah. i was that trying is to true. think about it that is true but i i know in that fight we did have at least one i think probably two or more redirect actions and i think there was even an outlast thrown thrown in there as well so it felt like much more than just destroy which is kind of exactly my point when talking about the crisis design just going just going the hit it over the head until it stops moving approach is usually the least interesting so i, I really like that uh that encounter building really brings that to the forefront yay uh i i will say one, one of the, one of the things i really liked is that i could that the first crisis we did had nothing to do with combat the the vision yeah. sequence in Maud's year. Oh, yeah. that was so yeah. interesting. That was such an interesting 
quote unquote combat. Yeah. Like that was uh that was really great. I loved that. I, I feel like in that one, destroy wasn't gonna be an option for us just because like destroy would be like go slap mod in the face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, no, we're not we're not we're not destroying the vision, we're not taking mod out of the vision, we're not trying to to shock mod away from it. None of that nonsense. Mm -hmm. Let's let's go in and see what we can do to help. <laughs> yeah. And because I had those those built in tools, the rules there uh, to in, encourage to to speak to what each of those goals represented. And I, I really like that in 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 crisis building and when presenting a crisis, you do encourage GMs to be pretty forefront with uh, or or. or forward direct about what each of these goals what what the what the crisis is about so every time we did a crisis i i told you what destroy would what what advancing destroy would generally yeah. mean and what it would entail uh or or redirect or at last what what you would need to do and how that would progress the narrative of course at the end of each of those i also added or anything you could come up with uh, but yeah. I, I really liked that in creation of these crises, you provide a, a prompt for the players to navigate their way through crisis resolution. Yeah. I, th I think that's helpful for both a, I... a crisis design standpoint, storytelling standpoint, and from getting players actively engaged and more than actively engaged creatively thinking about their engagement i also i think the reason i did that and i can't remember for sure because who knows why i do anything was that um i think redirect and outlast were kind of peculiar outcomes for a quote-unquote combat so i wanted to make sure that the rules involved putting story anchors on those mm -hmm. so that players who hadn't played this game could be like, okay, redirect looks like convincing the demon not to attack yeah. us in this fight. Mm -hmm. In this encounter, redirect means luring the horror away. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that was, I think I just wanted to make sure people could get their heads around redirecting or outlasting yeah. a combat. Yeah. Because it, it, if you're only used to playing D and D, which I mean, most of the time you roll initiative, your only objective is to hit things until they stop moving. Uh, it you know can be very jarring for players who are used to D and D coming into a game like this and going, "What? I can't just beat Maud over the head for this vision? Yeah. What am I supposed to do here?" <laughs> we probably could have. I mean, you could have been extremely but... naughty. Yeah, yeah, yeah it would have yeah. been very. It would have been out of character. For, yeah, for yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I was showing up like th this, like looking at Maude, who's clearly suffering. We're like, all right, like let's go to town. Yep. <laughs> like, let's start wailing on them. Very naughty. Yeah. It, it it's uh it's that quote from Firefly, uh in in the first episode, uh where they're interrogating a prisoner and the captain says to says to Jane, uh you're you're only supposed to scare him. You know that, right? And Jane goes, pain scary. <laughs> <laughs> And, I mean, yeah. Uh, strategic act, strategic application of pain can uh, can move some things along, but there's probably better ways to go about doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I I think the building encounter section of the rules was incredibly helpful. Talking well, about just... uh, actions per round, and I and I when designing an encounter i always had two copies of the rules open one here at building encounters and one at your little monster manual at at the at the back hey. with with uh sample encounters because both are both are really useful to have the rules breakdown as to how you go about creating something and then examples of how you go about creating something uh, because i i could see with the different encounters you designed especially after running one or two myself where the where the difficulty of that would fall in um let's see if i i have any exam i mean obviously noble demons are are huge but i i can kind of i can kind of see that uh the the radiant prince is is definitely going to be a much more uh 
you know, redirect a route, last strategic kind of engagement with uh with with the demon, whereas uh the princess of the Southern Isles will beat your ass. <laughs> I wrote an encounter that was just like, don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, look at that in the back of the book. Princess of the Southern Isles, six turns per round, destroy difficulty of ten, uh, all all kinds of abilities. Yeah, utter utter nonsense. <laughs> Just, just um, don't go there. Yeah. Just don't go there. Yeah. She'll eat you. Yeah. Her um, favorite thing is eating people. That's her demonic obsession. Don't go there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh no, but especially after running one or two encounters, I could definitely see where uh, your your breakdown of the the difficulties for for the goals lied. Uh I know in the beginning I was leaning closer to that uh you know, 3 to 5 area easy to challenging yeah. uh and then i realized you know you guys you guys are a well-oiled machine you picked some nice parts you bounce off of each other real well you're doing you're doing real good i'm gonna start ratcheting up my difficulty to difficult to that six to eight region and then you know what final fight pulling out all the stops ten deal with it <laughs> yeah seven eight, yeah. eight nine ten ten eight whatever whatever it turned out to be uh so i i most importantly not only did you present useful thresholds those thresholds worked in practice yeah that's i'm so glad to hear that because there's so many systems that provide those thresholds and then you actually you do that and you're like okay no i actually need to shave 30 percent of the hp off of this or it's just gonna take yeah. forever or uh, i need they can't hit this hard a, a cr5 creature one that does 40 damage per per turn and one that does 12 damage per turn how are they the same cr <laughs> um, yeah 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 balancing the encounters can be tricky yeah so i i think most importantly uh everything works the way it's presented to oh good 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 which, i'm very very glad which is a a more poignant compliment than it sounds because it's well, rarer than I'm it should game designer yeah. i know what that is yeah, like, yeah. I'm, I'm deeply grateful for it i assure you because <laughs> it's um one of the big one of the big stresses of making a big adventure game and i've made micro games i've made a lot of little micro games i love a little micro game but the thing about a big adventure game is the more moving power moving pieces that you have the more likely it is that somebody who has not played the game and who hasn't talked to you about the game mm -hmm. is not going to know what to do. And the more moving pieces you have, the more that likelihood gets turned mm -hmm. up. So it's always very important to me to have in-depth GM sections because mm -hmm. you do not want someone to pick up your game and be like, I want to play this game, but I don't think I could run it because then mm -hmm. nobody's going to play your game. Yeah, It's not I, what you want. I mean, Kat, you can attest to this. I I might have asked you a couple questions here or there about lore, but that was it. That was it. You that didn't know anything good. about you didn't know anything about the discovery stuff I had planned. You didn't nope. know anything about the crises, about uh, how how they were structured, about the additional rules. I didn't ask you questions about balance. So everything nope. that you see played out in the game, I did on my own, and honestly, yep. with only a few hours of prep each week, if if that, if That's that such a relief to like genuinely the first day when you did the rules breakdown and i was like oh okay i had no part of this yeah okay. that, that was all me yeah yeah which, which is not a brag to me that's a brag to cat's brag design cat. that's yeah no that's me <laughs> yeah i didn't have to ask any questions i looked at the rules i looked at the table contents and like okay this looks important yep that's important i'm gonna jot that down i mean i i spent uh to to learn to learn to learn enough to do that first episode, the rules break down three, maybe four hours. Most of that just organizing it and getting my thoughts straight so that I could teach it to other people. Again, yeah, learning a new game does not need to take a lot of time, does not, to, does not need to be super complicated and complex, especially the more you do it because this is the bajillionth game I've had to learn for myself, I can look at a well, like, my greatest compliment to any indie designer is, this is a nice table of contents. That is the yeah. best compliment I can give anybody, because if I can look at a table of contents and be like, that looks important. Oh, hey, that is important. That's it. That's all I need. That's all I need. 
Yeah, I love it. I'm I'm so delighted with this entire. I know we've still got we're halfway. We're only halfway. But I'm so <laughs> delighted with how this went. I had a mm. really wonderful time. I mean, let, let me let me throw that question back at you guys. Was there any part in any of these crises where things didn't seem right? Where things lagged or they felt overly burdensome or things weren't clear? Not not really to me. Um, I I feel like I feel like and again, you're not going to hurt my feelings. <laughs> I'm, I'm no, good no, with no. Uh, with critiques. Uh, occasionally, the the crisis we were up against would seem a little bit daunting, uh, especially in that that final one. Yeah. But that also seemed cinematically appropriate. Like this is a narratively daunting task. This shouldn't be something where I'm just like, all right. I can see exactly how we're going to win in three moves. Mm. Yeah. You know, it, it should be I'm so worried about something that, that, that has that yeah. that weight to it of what am I going to do? What decision can I make that that can advance this while protecting people? And, you know, but putting that pressure on us in that final fight or in that that final crisis was a, I think, pretty perfect. Um, and there did seem to be an escalating scale as we went, you know, the vision was relatively easy for us to, to sort of work our way through. And, and very we... minor consequences to have to deal with. Exactly. And then we get to the town of Tangle, uh, and there's suddenly civilian lives on the line, mm -hmm. and we are struggling to to fight our way through to the well and we don't know what we're even going to find in the well but ultimately the first the first real encounter with the tangle was something that we were absolutely prepared to handle we mm -hmm. we had everything we needed and then you know it just it continued to scale up and i feel like it scaled up perfectly in line with with the stakes you know we we went from dealing with the town that's already overrun to can we rescue these archaeologists and can we can we save these other rangers who are trapped between two deadly encounters like it it was it was never something where i felt like it wasn't balanced to what we could do and if it was something that was more difficult than than what we had encountered before, we were given other resources, like the other rangers, like Maud, like the four armies that we could dispose of in the final uh, final encounter. There, you know, you you did an expert job of making sure that that was all well balanced. I think that, you know, the four hours you spent prepping for that initial rule session clearly paid off because. You know, you you built these encounters perfectly. Yeah, they were yeah. very intense. Mm. I think, like, just a hundred percent, like, hard agree. I also feel like there's like a lot of thoughts in my head about how heroic chords system is like just crisis system is set up, and then Jack with like you putting in all this effort to create very interesting and very narratively complex um crises like that really like even though some things were easy or there wasn't that much consequences right like there wasn't so, like we weren't like oh we're over scattered and like depleted until like the second one <laughs> but like until like even like the first one it was still very narratively interesting like it was there's still like a lot of really good stuff like happening um whenever we made a decision as players but then also during the crisis's turn like that whole interaction it was just it was just like it was very good like i don't i struggle to find stuff to critique i guess mm. is what i'm saying yeah. like it, it it's just so yeah. like interesting like everything moves and like there's a pace there's a good flow to it like i also think we as players like y'all crushed it like i it could have felt kind of clunky i guess because i mean i only had one turn y'all two y'all had like multiple turns but like it was interesting like it wasn't like there was any like thing where i was like oh god like they got two turns like i don't wait it was like no like whenever you did something 
it added to the suspense or it added to the narrative. It made the story richer and it didn't take away from it at all. So yeah, I'm like, I struggle. I think, I think part of it was like, also when, when Doyle got two turns, like you and I were still part of the conversation. Yeah. It, so was it wasn't incredible. like we just sat back for pat time. Like mm. it was still <laughs> part of the discussion. Yeah. And it was like, it oh yeah yeah and like also when like Doyle got two turns I was cheering I was like yeah, yeah. <laughs> go <laughs> and it, and then it was just like it was so wonderful it was so easy I guess it was like I wouldn't I'm not like easy in like the well we just rolled like fifteen successes and now we can and like the to clear out last is three so we we're just gonna clear it like the first round but it was like it felt like everything we did had like a purpose and it we saw it through and that felt really good mm -hmm. like it was it felt very easy to like enjoy not easy like enjoyable it felt very enjoyable yay i yeah. i feel like to, to a certain extent like you could play this in sort of a min max style you could definitely speed run something like this and if we had done that, this would have been a very different story because mm -hmm. we could have we could have advanced Outlast and run away from the Tangle in the beginning instead of destroying it. Mm -hmm. We could have, you know, we could have done the same for the encounter uh, with the the Hollow and everything, you mm -hmm. know. And at that point, we're giving it time to grow. We're giving it time to to get stronger. We. We don't know what would have happened if we advanced Outlast in that final one. Would the would the hollow of one, or would, or the, the I keep calling it a hollow. The horror of would, would the horror of one, or would the tangle of one? And if the tangle won, what does that mean for us in the final encounter? What does that mean for mm -hmm. Maud? Does Maud expend more energy and become weaker for the final encounter? Do we have a, a harder final battle because we chose to take the easy road? And, and because we looked at the narrative instead of just the difficulty, mm -hmm. we tended to always pick a path that made the next move make sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and in my mind, when it comes to GMing and coming up with a story and building encounters, the the difficulty you 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 speak of just you you could go for the easiest numerical difficulty in this fight but that's going to make things more difficult later so as 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 players and as the gm you have to consider a, a a bigger picture approach just because this number is smaller than this number this smaller number is probably going to have more consequences or or something like that which i tried to be yeah. Not fully transparent about, but I definitely had the opacity meter turned down quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm not that nice to my players. I I will I will let them know after they've made a decision. There will be consequences for this. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> but you know. <laughs> uh, but my I... favorite tricks for consequences is uh, edge successes. Mm -hmm. I do this to Kirsten all the time. Kirsten will be trying to do something, and I'll be like, if you keep the edge successes, you succeed. Yeah. Oh, no. And then, like, <laughs> I, yeah, that's exactly, like, at first, Kirsten's like, yeah. No. What have I done? <laughs> yep. You yep. don't. It would be bad if I succeeded. <laughs> like, it's always a very fun moment when I get to do that. Mm -hmm. I usually do it to Kirsten. But <laughs> to be fair, she's the one who has the worst ideas. So... And I I would so, definitely say that the edge success mechanic was at the same time the most interesting and the most difficult. <laughs> uh because coming yeah. up on the fly with interesting ways to to tailor each of those edge successes uh can can be a lot especially in the heat of things. But I do like that you have guidelines in the book for exactly what you can do with those edge successes. Uh, yeah. and, and real easy things like, okay, one for one damage, one for one scatter, or if it's something bigger, you can buy them off individually. One costs one, but two costs three, or they're two apiece and you have to buy them off piecemeal sort of thing. So there's definitely guidelines for you to quickly be like, okay, I don't have anything super narratively interesting right now. 
take some damage, take some scatter. Uh, but I, I mean, that's, that's another question I'll throw back on you guys. Uh, were there any times when you felt like the edge successes were either unfair or uninteresting? Mm. Not really. I, I always enjoyed the edge successes. Yeah, I think if they were uninteresting, we were just like, I think we all felt as a table that we couldn't think of an interesting thing. So we took something uninteresting and moved on, yeah. and the next time it was interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So I, I think the uninteresting ones didn't get in our way. Yeah. Yeah. And I know there we were plenty of times where, where I was like, you know, you don't need those successes, or the what you're doing isn't so narratively heavy that it needs to have this big consequence. Let, let's just move past it, which, yeah. you know, I, I, I think is good. Because if you're only if you're only rolling to I don't know cook something, it, the it, for for an edge success the fire's not going to explode and you're gonna you know get third degree burns on your arm. No, you you just pick some bad mushrooms and move on. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, we didn't move on from that one though. That was but you didn't really just move on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, yeah. I will say this every time talking about how to be a good how to be a good GM. The best way to be a good GM is to have good players. <laughs> <laughs> yay okay dinner's yucky how do our three different people react to dinner being yucky mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I gave you guys real little cute. snippet prompts to work with and you all ran with it mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that was, was a really great cute. cold open for this show yeah, yeah. It was just like callous waiting till no one was looking which kind of echoed later in the story mm -hmm. where callous will like do the right thing as long as she's being watched yeah, <laughs> like Alice is very worried about how people perceive her more about more than she is about um whether she's doing the right thing. She's worried about whether she's seen doing the right thing. Yeah, and um, Marius is self sacrificing. Fucking shovel <laughs> just eats the mushrooms, winces, mm -hmm. but eats the mushrooms. Um. And then later Doyle on is, is throwing is, himself in, in front of every damaging thing possible. Yeah. Doyle is forever the realist, forever the pragmatist, is just picking the mushrooms out. Yep, just sifting through, making sure there are no mushrooms mm -hmm. in the spoon. Yeah. 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 Which is like and then what? you look later on you look later on at Doyle, and Doyle is the one who goes in the well. Doyle is the one who like has written off the city because Doyle is a pragmatist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and who's concerned with just getting things done in the effective way. So uh, I think that out of a silly edge success, which was dinner is yucky. We got a scene that was extremely instructive on yeah. these three characters. Yes. Yeah. I would agree. I would agree. So I I'll defend mushrooms to my dying day. Yeah. I'll defend that. Edge <laughs> success. Yeah, that was, that was good. I, I really enjoyed that opening um, and and it, it sort of it gave us an excuse to do more role play in our initial campfire. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, and, you know, it wasn't just, oh, well, uh, you you made the dinner. I gathered the ingredients. You set up the tents like mm -hmm. it, it was an actual interaction. And, and that was it was fun. Yeah, I, I, I like having a even if it's established prior to the game that your characters all know each other, especially when you're playing with a new group of people, all the players don't know each other. So I, I do really like starting out with the option for role play with little scenarios like that, low consequence scenarios. Like I said, little little prompts that I give you, hey, they're doing this. How do, how do you react to that? Or what are you doing here? Yada, yada, yada. Uh, and that's a, that's a great way to get everybody invested in the game, invested in their character, invested in other characters, Instead of just sitting down, you're at a tavern, the mysterious hooded figure walks over and hands you a contract. I mean... So I'm glad I'm glad you guys enjoyed that, and I'm really glad you yeah. took that idea and ran with it. Because that that was a great open to this show. Yeah. Love mushroom time. Yeah. Uh okay. Let's let's actually uh we we've gone a little over because I've I've thoroughly enjoyed this discussion let's take a quick break real quick uh yeah. and we're definitely coming back with more discussions probably more uh more poignantly again on the rules tools and themes so we'll be covering again the we've already talked a bit about about 
crisis design, uh, but we'll talk a bit more about the basics and breaking down the uh, the attributes, the facets. Uh, plenty of conversation on key, uh, the key motivators for the characters and how to use them, Yay. scatter, um, discovery rules, spell casting. So there's definitely more to come. Uh, stay tuned for that. We're going to go take like a six, eight minute break somewhere around there. Uh, yeah, so get up, stretch your legs, get a drink descatter as much as you can and we'll be back in a few minutes for uh for more critical rules analysis of heroic core Yay. Yay. stay tuned everybody listen to some cool music Thank you. 
And we are back for the, well, it's not really the second half because we went a little skewed here, uh, but for the last bit of our uh, final episode of RPGs Uncovered Season 2. Uh, we've been having a thoroughly enjoyable and very insightful conversation about not only uh the the whole demo play series that we've had and the amazing characters and amazing times we've had in it uh but also the rules uh as a whole and how they've um how how we've navigated them both as as the gm myself and as players here and i think that's what we're going to focus on for the remainder of this uh as as much as any of us are capable of focusing <laughs> uh yeah <laughs> uh so let's see and and of course chat uh feel free to drop questions in the chat for us uh and uh or yes uh feel free to drop some questions in the chat if you have any questions on you know how the game is played how how rules are navigated how rules came up in the show itself i tried to be fairly transparent with how uh, all the rules were taking place in the game itself. I always like to stop and define how the dice pools were made. Uh, fortunately, that was all player side because the GM doesn't have to worry about rolling any dice in this system. It's great. Takes a lot of uh, takes a lot of pressure off of me. I don't need to worry about rolling criticals and yeah. <laughs> uh, I I know I know when I play D and D, I'm like, okay, great, twenty, awesome. Oh no, what did I just do? Uh, so it, it's fun playing a, playing a system where uh, where the GM doesn't need to worry about dice, and they really only need to worry about uh, helping direct the narrative and coming up with in interesting consequences and reactions. Uh, anyway, throw questions in chat if you got them, because we're all here to yeah. answer. Uh, let's let's see. We've we've talked quite a bit about encounter design and how the encounters played out, how each crisis played out. But I think more, uh, more fine-tuned than that, how, uh, I think this is most, most specifically towards Pat and Donna here, uh, with, with this system being so very different from, from D&D, or really a, a lot of other games I've played, I don't know about you two in particular, uh, how did you feel about the attributes in the game, the facets in this game, daring, understanding, subtlety, sensitivity, adaptability, and how that helped define your characters and your action ability in the game? I I really liked them. Um, you know, obviously, we got more use out of some than we did out of others. Um, Everyone had free and, and adaptability, and everyone had one in daring. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. we Smart we didn't do a lot please. of daring. Um, I love that when it made sense, though. You you guys were like, yeah, that that's daring. All right, I'll roll my two dice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, as much as I would prefer to roll this in something else, I have to agree it's daring. I'm gonna stab this guy in the face. That's adaptability, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, we're adapting to the no? fact that we have to. <laughs> Land a blow on this guy. I'm, yeah. I, I'm, I'm adapting his face to include a new hole. No? <laughs> Fine. What if what if instead of stabbing him with my knife, I hit him with this rock I found? I found a rock. That's adaptability, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, but uh but I, I think that that um in a longer game, I would have liked to see us use some of the other uh, attributes a little bit more like mm. we didn't get to see a lot that had to do with subtlety or with mm. with daring um you know we had a pretty straightforward role and most of our enemies were not human and not able to be reasoned with or lied to so subtlety didn't come up quite so much um yeah. and i think that in a longer game that might be something I wanted to explore more, mm -hmm. but in this one, it just always seemed to make more sense to use understanding or sensitivity or, mm -hmm. or, you know, adaptability, obviously, uh, and daring begrudgingly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think that, that this system really does work well because it's, it's never a situation where one is so far 
above the others that you would completely avoid it. Um, we we weren't ever in a situation where oh adaptability will absolutely solve all of our problems, uh, and daring is useless. Mm -hmm. Not for lack of trying on our part, but we yeah. so in that situation. We just had terrible luck when rolling daring. Mm. Yeah. Oh yeah, we mm -hmm. can't. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a die. Like, try hard. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> we're, we're tacticians. We we think with our brain. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I I will say I I tried to present each of these encounters in ways, and not just not just crises, but different scenarios that you were in, in ways that could push you a little bit more towards um you know, one facet or another. And I know we definitely got some subtlety out of out of Doyle in the initial surveillance of the town. Yeah. Uh, we got some subtlety with uh with some of the, the redirect conversations with the with the ghosts, I believe, right? Oh, yeah. A combination of subtlety mm -hmm. and sensitivity with reasoning with the ghosts. Um Yeah, I I'm not saying that it, it didn't happen right. at all. Just not not that... as much as uh, adaptability, which everybody had the benefit of ha having their best uh, best skills in, their best yeah, skills absolutely. In. Yeah. And and like, I I'm I'm not necessarily saying there was anything lacking with this campaign. Mm -hmm. It just it feels like subtlety is the thing that we did the least with. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, it just happened to come out that way. Yeah, it yeah. just that that's just how it it happened to shake out and. Partially because we rode over that wall on a sky elf. Well, this, <laughs> right. You tried so hard. Yeah. You know, like, the, Jack was just like, you guys could take the class. I was like, I'm not suggesting it because I don't want to ruin, I don't want to rain on Pat's, like, parade and be like, hey, we're not making it over. Well, like, and and th this is I'd... one of those things where, where, like, I do love that there are sometimes narrative constraints because, like, I really wanted us to sneak into that town, mm -hmm. but the only option for sneaking into that town was burning it down from the other side while we sneak in while it's distracted. And I didn't want to burn down the town. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we yeah. Didn't want to do that. <laughs> I mean, when it when it came to the cloud elk and being like, you guys could just fly over, I personally was just astounded that the first thing you guys didn't say was, we can just fly over the wall. <laughs> I'm so I used to playing D and D and having the wizard or the sorcerer be like. I have fly, actually, your encounter is null and void. We just go over. <laughs> you know that pit with all those traps and snakes and explosions at the bottom? I fly over it. Gravity. I, I can't help I can't help but think like a rogue, and my thought was we should definitely sneak up on this mm -hmm. entire town of plant monster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh hard. You're like, is there a tree? Is there a long branch? Is there anything? <laughs> I was like, I'm really not gonna suggest I was like Nefo and I gotta just chill. <laughs> until until Pat resigns Doyle mm -hmm. to no, getting yeah, on yeah. the back of there, my cloud. There was out. there was no way that, that was gonna work. We weren't gonna be able to sneak in without causing the, the big diversion of a fire and mm -hmm. that's just, you know. Yeah. I mean what was there a way certainly? Would have been would it have been difficult possibly have extra consequences to it? You know, probably. probably. It, I, I do think Doyle alone could have got over that wall no problem could have snuck into that town no problem when it when it and comes to died alone <laughs> and then died alone yeah but but when it comes to uh oh, to, to kalos with one subtlety and marius uh who who is a big boy <laughs> three subtlety but a big boy <laughs> uh, uh, uh the lad only has one subtlety it, did you, is it subtlety and sensitivity were switched uh, yeah yes was two. Yeah. he's a sensitive boy <laughs> yeah but he's not very Sneaky. That's what it was. That's what it was. Yes. So uh, the other two not having great dice pool in uh, in subtlety yeah. or your your uh, your skills in uh, in being sneaky. <laughs> yeah. No, oh, I I think that I think that we played out our, our attributes pretty well, and I I like that everybody was focused on adaptability because. Like to me, that is just that is an excellent attribute to even have mm -hmm. as an option. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the the ability to look around and MacGyver your way out of a problem mm -hmm. is important in an adventurer. Uh, that might just be because I I have a soft spot for the old penny dreadfuls. 
where that was very much a trope, but mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. I know I. I know I. Classic. I I know I when uh when scheduling for this game when when picking you guys as the cast because I probably talked to two or three dozen people, uh, I I definitely weighed this more towards well exactly how this group actually played out, uh people who. It, it, we, I, I talked to each of you and uh, got really creative responses uh, from, from the prompts that I gave you and from, you know, how would you use daring? How would you combine these two skills? How would you combine these two keywords to make a spell? Uh, and I was I was really impressed by by all of it. I mean, honestly, I didn't I, obviously I didn't need to really vet cat at all. <laughs> Uh, but but Pat and and Donna, I was really impressed with with your uh, interviews, really, uh, with your responses Yay! to those questions and how creative you were with those and how uh, I, I guess naturally and and easy collaboratively it it came to you guys uh, because this is a game that could be very jarring to people who aren't used to looking at their attributes as varying means of approaching a problem and instead look at them as character defining traits like strength dexterity wisdom intelligence whatnot uh see so you guys really quickly adapted to what i consider a very very different set of attributes to the traditional D, &D attributes lends to a very different type of gameplay uh, because I, I feel like you guys would have thought about everything you did differently if you had to go, uh, am I using strength or dexterity? Is this an intelligence thing? Is this charisma? But it's it's not about how how high you put each of your your sliding bars that define your 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 physical or mental traits. It's how you it's how you go about doing things, which forces you to think about how you go about doing things. Oh yeah, Absolutely. and you going off of that like how it's also like what do we what information do we want to gather during mm -hmm. like the discover roles right where it's like i'm gonna do like understanding i'm like an understanding discovery role or subtlety or like and we all got like very like different things that we were mm -hmm. like interested in finding and interesting about learning more and i think like it just really enriched i don't know the setting <laughs> It really enriched the setting. Like it, it felt like a JRPG. Like it felt like you were walking around and like you saw something like shiny in the distance. You're like I'm gonna wander over there and press A and see like we'll see what I got. It felt yeah. very much like that. I uh, I really I wanted. I have several mechanics whose explicit purpose in this game is for players to signal to the GM what they want, mm -hmm. and the biggest ones are lesson and discovery. Like, lesson is just like, hey, when it comes time for Marius' story, I want him to learn mm -hmm. to respect other people's strength. Um, and on a smaller scale, discovery is just like, you know what? I want something relevant. I'm invested in the plot as it is. I don't want a diversion. I want something that ties in. Mm -hmm. So I'm rolling, in, I'm rolling understanding. Because um, I think it can be hard. Like, I'm the kind of person who finds it very difficult to straight up just like tell a GM what I want. But I think if the mechanics give you like choices in that regard, mm -hmm. then that makes that a little bit easier. And the, the character creation process prompts you to think about those things ahead of time and ingrain them in the character. Yeah. Which, which leads you to your ability to, uh, to, to roll off of the GM's prompts and to to, to to help facilitate that communication, because yes, uh, as Jesse is pointing out, communication is hard. Tools definitely help, and and having your yeah, having things defined during character creation, and having uh having prompts to help you think about things as you enact change throughout the story is very helpful. And I think we definitely saw that in a number of instances relating back to each of your lessons, which is probably more more difficult to you know overtly showcase than than the discovery rules but we did see i think from each of you uh engagement with your lesson obviously there was that bit at the end of uh 
of the last episode with Marius and that whole 180 with uh, the, the militia conversation. Uh, and I, I'm hoping we will be getting oh, yeah, we're, uh, Pat we're back. We're a little bit patless. Yeah, we're a little patless, yeah. which is thrown off the cameras. But hopefully they will be. Hopefully he'll be back with us shortly. I know he's in a hotel. Oh, there. there we go. All right. There we go. Cool. There cool. Sorry, totally guys. fine. No I'm worries. Fine. Hotel internet had the first hiccup since yep. I got here. Um, hey, it's lasted so... this long. Yeah, that's yeah, great. yeah. Like I, I was testing it over the last couple of days. It had no problems. This is the first time it's gone out on me. Mm -hmm. Of course. Mm -hmm. But we're glad to see you back. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we we were just mentioning. I think everybody everybody did a good job of engaging with uh, with their lessons, which I which we did see in that last episode. I think from everybody, uh, Marius and and the militia conversation. Obviously, Doyle. I I know in that last um, sort of cinematic epilogue you had for uh Doyle's justifications and how how he went about doing things and the actions he took and whether he's he's alive or not you related back to your lesson of you are a part of the world you move through uh and I think that did help define your character and uh especially Kalos when it comes to helping define character and helping define the actions you took as your character I think your your lesson of understanding your own boundaries uh and and being firm with them how 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 would you guys rate that as uh, as a useful player tool? Did that that help you in your navigation of of being your character? Absolutely. Um, you know, for from from my perspective, Doyle in in the backstory that I wrote, it was all about how he sat back, he watched, he listened, he tried to learn as much as he could. He was always the observer. And in almost every encounter we had, he had to step forward and actually put himself into the fray. Mm -hmm. He had to take part. He couldn't sit back and watch and just gather information. And so he very much learned that his actions have just as much consequence as inaction. Mm -hmm. And and for Donna, I think perhaps yours was was even a bit more cerebral and more personal to yourself. How how did that influence how you were navigating your character? I think it's like cool too, because like when you look at the character sheet, it's like at the top. Mm -hmm. Like I mean, like it's, right it's like you it's right there. Like you get like your your name, your pronouns, the class, what range you want, then bam, lesson. Like what story and like what narrative do you want to go like what journey do you want to bring this character you've picked out like what type of ranger they are and their name and everything but it's like and i think it's like really important to character creation and even like just in general i think it's just like about like who are you making and like what journey you want to explore with them is like very important to me mm. whenever i make a character for any sort of like tabletop rpg game and um and it's like when i was making callows it was kind of interesting because i was like i wonder i was looking at like everything and of course you want to figure out like what rangers there are and like everything about that and like what you could do and like all this stuff but it was really just about like but like what kind of character do i want to have like what kind mm -hmm. of character i think i actually came because because it's up there it's like what lesson do you want them to learn and and mm -hmm. then kind of filling in the rest right like the skeleton is pretty much like what lesson like the ranger class what season it is one and then boom like the lesson and i think it's very it makes sense like as a function of part of the game because it's like we've been saying it's collaborative storytelling like your focus is collaborative storytelling and so when you emphasize the importance of a lesson and wanting a character to learn a lesson it encourages that element of storytelling like this isn't just going to be somebody who like hits stuff and is like cool i learned nothing but boy oh boy did i like enjoy destroying things mm -hmm. and might be a very flat and two-dimensional character instead adding that extra layer of dimension almost necessitating it in the character creation mm -hmm. process was very good i really enjoyed it mm -hmm. i'm glad on on top of that this is um this sort of piggybacks pretty well on on what you just said this is the kind of this is the kind of thing i might add to a, a game 
even if I was playing it in some other system, just to encourage a new player to learn to role play. Mm -hmm. it, it gives them a starting point of, okay, what is my character's focus? What is, and, and it, it builds it into the system. Um, you know, and, and sort of similarly, like I would compare it almost to, almost to like the hindrances and edges in Savage Worlds. Most of the hindrances listed are role play specific. You can get things like curious or cautious or, or things like that, where it's like, okay, so your character has the need to figure out what's going on over there. And, and so tying in, tying in role play to the system itself through the lesson, I think is a great way to get newer players, people who aren't as experienced mm -hmm. out of their shell and sort of give them the framework for that, that motivation to experiment with role playing and, and to think more critically about why their character is going to do what they're going to do rather than just saying, okay, well, it's my turn. I guess I get to go do the next thing. It's yeah. well, let, let's, let's build some narrative around it. And mm -hmm. this is a good way to do it. Actually, really good point. Cause it's like, there's so many aspects about this game that are like perfect for like someone who's new to like role playing and like, but wants to get in. It's like, an amazing system because it encourages them to be so creative right like you have your spell pieces and then if you want to cast a spell and you want to scatter it's like okay first off you got to come up with it and then you gotta do yep. a little bargaining where like you know you're like i'm gonna take this much scatter or maybe you don't you're like yeah i just want to advance this like the requirement is this like i'll just take that scatter um but then also it's like the element of scatter where you know, your character starts to lose parts of themselves and you become like, you have to role play that. Like you can't be the same person because you're scattered. You're different in a mm -hmm. way. Um, and not in like a detrimental way, you're just different. But that's something that you also have to role play well. Like you have to understand and really get into your character. So I actually really like, like it's one of the best games for, I think like, someone who's new to role playing like i would definitely absolutely recommend it. And, and like you know one of the questions that that you asked us many times jack was what does scatter what does four scatter look like to callus yeah. what does eight scatter look like to marius what what does you are fully scattered but was through you know through the through the uh the cord mm -hmm. so you're not unconscious what does a fully scattered doyle do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well <laughs> He needs to know what's in that well. <laughs> well, Kalos doesn't really care what these people think. They're getting treated. Yeah. And that's, that's the best I can do for them. Mm -hmm. Well, I've forgotten that I'm afraid of people, so I guess I'm just going to babble on to whoever's <laughs> nearest to me about how great my friends are. <laughs> like, I, I loved I, all I, of Marius's conversations with really actually nobody. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and I, I think that 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 question and and that system, once again, it it pulls out the it pulls out what really makes these characters seem more real. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that is that is a great way to teach people how to think about their characters when they're building them in other systems, too. Mm hmm. Um, my favorite thing that the two of you did with your characters is that you both found your inspiration for your characters in the same thing, which is the silly little you might have section that has no <laughs> mechanical input on anything that I put in every ranger type. Mm -hmm. And both of you saw something in that list and that sprouted into your characters. And I just I love that very much because it was just kind of a little flavor text section. But mm -hmm. uh, I'm glad it was helpful to help people realize their characters. Absolutely. Yeah. I just think you made a good game. Like, oh, hands yeah. down. Like, I don't... I, I, I just think you made, like, a really good game. Like, <laughs> there, There's a really well-crafted balance between explicitly Sweet. defined rules 
expl uh, explanations and examples of those rules and suggestions. And the, oh, the combination yeah. of all three of those makes for a really easy game to understand and a, and a game that really uh, translates, as, as we've already said, into well-defined characters that are, that are easy to move through the action of the story. Yeah. It's just, like, really good. I don't know. I think I'm definitely going to miss playing this with y'all. <laughs> It's like it was like it was like it's like a similar feeling to like when I guess like because we were talking about like the narrative and if they were like changed anything or done anything but like I really like the narrative like I really like the story that we told I really like all the choices we made I don't know if like we were to do the exact same thing again like I personally would be like let's just not change it let's just go the same way <laughs> like maybe roll better that's it yeah, like, get yeah. more sixes <laughs> but like aside from that like it's it was. Like the equivalence to like, to me, it was like finishing a very good game and like putting the controller down and being like, yeah, that was good. Like, hey, I was mm. satisfied with that. And just like luxuriating in that feeling. And like, I mean, we did like four episodes, but I yeah. still got that, you know, like it was amazing. Wow. And yeah, I do think it's like, what's also really cool too is that like Jack, like kudos to you, man. Like you DM'd. Yeah excellently you were like the like it was fabulous but then also kudos to the players like y'all too like y'all brought it like i really think in a game like this it's like the imag your imagination is like the limit and because we're all like really good at that <laughs> like we all like we were able to tell this like very amazing and almost like grandiose story in like four episodes where mm. it was it, it was very fulfilling and I really, I just like it. Yeah, I just like that. Mm -hmm. I, I've been very fortunate to have very good players uh, for these little four-part mini-series mm -hmm. that I do. Of course, I'm drawing from a pool of, of two seasons. Hopefully that will continue. Uh, but I'll, I'll say again, being a good GM, having a good story, having a good game is just as much on the players as it is on the on the GM. You could be the best GM in the world if you don't have good players. It, it's the, the game's going to be a little lackluster. And on the opposite side of things, if you if, if you have a, a number of great role players in your group and your and your DM is really only interested in getting this number as high as possible, this number as low as possible, and beating things, uh, you know, things are going to be a little lacking yeah. for everyone. So again, session zero, everyone meet up, get in the same headspace. But when you have a, when you have a GM and a number of players all collaboratively working towards the best story you can get, you're going to get the best story you can get. Yeah. And we did. We're a good team. We really did. Yeah. Absolutely. This was a really wonderful team. Mm -hmm. I agree entirely. And a great time. Mm-hmm. Uh, man, there, there was a lot of things I was going to segue off of this whole branching conversation we've had. Uh, but let me, let me also point out in our discussion of character creation and the ease of character creation and the ease of facilitating roleplay with character creation. If that's something you're not familiar with, if you're just getting into a role-playing game and you're not used to creating characters that have these lessons they're working towards, or you don't know what your key motivators might be, you don't know what kind of skills you might focus on, uh, there is a really useful part of this book full of random tables. Page 20, starting on page 20, you can you can roll or pick from a menu yeah. of, you know, what uh, what class you are, if you need help choosing a class uh, or what 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 facets you're good or bad at, whether you roll or just pick. Uh, and then a lot more narrative things like your like your origin, which doesn't really have any mechanical value to it, uh, but has more narrative backstory character defining value to it. Like your origin, where you come from, what you've done, um, you know what you what you find beautiful, your own your own aesthetic, what you like, what you don't like, your general attitude, uh, the history of some of the things you've done. There's a lot of great. I, I really like that that this uh, random table section has a great combination of things that are mechanically necessary for your character. And also things that are mechanically irrelevant to your character, but ne but but help facilitate what that character is necessary for your uppercase character. 
that they were fun to write to mm. write i think i listened to a lot of the podcast system mastery which is um the gents who who run that one are very influenced by palladium and so i'm constantly listening to this game design podcast run by people who love random tables and so it's kind of just been poured into my ear that like random tables are fun actually mm. so yeah and i'm i'm very glad i put them in there because they're fun actually and and whether you like just the random chaotic element of rolling for all of these attributes or whether it's just helpful you for you to see a small list of examples and suggestions whether you roll or you pick the just having that list there is extremely helpful for new people to get into character designing from a character creation standpoint as a, as aside from a mechanical build standpoint hmm. Yay! Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, got a little, got a little distracted there. Um, <laughs> but also coming off of the conversation of lessons and defining your character and how they move through the narrative, the other big portion of that, the other key contributor of that, Yay. is your character's key, your key motivators. Uh, and uh, I do believe, uh, yeah, there one of the one of the random tables is. Uh, you, you could you could roll or you could pick off of some examples for your key, but <laughs> Five I know of the random tables. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but you can also come come at that on your own, and I I think that's how uh mo most of us did that, and I was really interested to see what what your key motivators were and how they helped define that character, and as you guys were using your key motivators. Uh, obviously, there's a mechanical usefulness to that. You you can check that off. You can get plus two to your dice pool with a with a fairly simple concession of okay, how does this relate to that key motivator? How does it make you anxious? Or uh, how how is this being cautious? Or uh, how are you extending your trust or whatnot? Whatever whatever it may be, there's a mechanical benefit. But obvious, but honestly, there is. Uh, the the greater value to it in my mind from a from a designer, uh, from a from a character builder, from a player, would be again that it really codifies into the rules, defining your character's character and giving them guidelines for how they navigate through your action. Uh, can can any of you guys speak to? You know how helpful that was for you and how that how how you looked at a situation and went. I don't know what I'm doing, but hey, I got this key. That's a, I know exactly what I'm doing now. I love key. It's fun. As I, I mean, pointed out before, I am not succinct, so I don't know if that made any sense. Yeah. <laughs> it it did. It did. Um I I would say for for me at the very least, the key uh most the the most strongly I felt that it came into play. And that was a terrible sentence I just said, but forgive me, um, was in that final uh, crisis uh, where where I saw the old world tech and just immediately it clicked. Oh, yeah, this this was Doyle's whole goal was learning about the old world, learning about pre cataclysm society and and how things worked and oh i finally get a chance to see it oh but it's trying to kill us because the tangle mm -hmm. um and that just that made it for me the the perfect moment to pull out the the final key piece of wonder and then i should have held on to that a little bit longer but didn't <laughs> yeah yeah i mean listen you gotta think about you gotta I, I i will say i probably min maxed that like in a way where i was like i'll unlock the final piece for the <laughs> combat that's why i was like i'm gonna cast the big spell unlock the final piece then cast another big spell mm -hmm. but yeah i if i had been thinking about it more tactically which is usually what i pride myself on in <laughs> games like this then i would have held off on that but you know, that I that is also think about it. 
That is also a great compliment to a story-focused GM, hearing that, you know, I'm usually more tactical, but in my yeah. mind, you know, that means uh, you couldn't afford to be tactical. I pushed you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. You did. you did give us a shovey. I love it. I love it. Uh, no, I, I do think we saw a lot of these key motivators come out, not only in how they were used mechanically for each of your roles, but in how it defined your character. Yeah. Uh, the, the caution and duty and devotion that, uh, that Marius portrayed, confidence in the things that he was clearly and, and knowingly good at. It's, uh, I always like to give people either slightly contradictory ones or straight up like bad ones. Mm -hmm. So I was like, this is an anxious person who's not great with people. I'm still giving him the key piece confidence mm -hmm. because when he knows something, he knows he knows it. Yeah. And like I had a character in Sword of Symphonies whose um, who's key included the word sloth because she just doesn't want to work. And if if she's trying to use her skills to find a way out of doing extra work, she can get two dice on that. And I just I I love using key in messy ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Well, one of my oh no, go ahead. Sorry, go on. Uh, I I was just gonna gonna say you know one of one of my favorite things whenever I'm given the chance to to set up key motivators and things like that is to use. Uh, both curious and cautious because yes I desperately mm -hmm. need to know what that noise was but I also desperately need Marius to go figure it out <laughs> <laughs> oh my god mm -hmm. yeah 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 <laughs> That's... yeah I've I love seeing conflicting keys I just think it's it's very fun mm -hmm. Mm. I also like that like the parts of the keys don't have to be like positive like you know yeah. like yeah. Up, like it's not like you have to fill it with like all these like good things like you can fill it with like different things or you could fill it with things that are left to be like ambiguous but you can choose whether or not they should be like good or should be bad it mm -hmm. just depends on the situation mm -hmm. yeah it's uh, one of my characters is Miller, who I play whenever Kirsten runs things on sort of symphonies. And he's always eating. He's like Brad Pitt's character in Ocean's Eleven. He just always somehow has food in his hands. Yeah. And I gave him the key piece hunger. And it's just if he's hungry, he's very food motivated. Mm -hmm. And if he's if he's hungry, he's going to get food and you're not going to get in his way. And that's part of who he is. In addition to his just what else did I put on there? Uh love competition caution and pacifism like he's a very he's a very sweet fellow until you come between him and his burger <laughs> uh -huh. and i can relate to that and get hangry yeah. <laughs> uh yeah so obviously the the key that you guys chose is another great way of defining your character yeah yeah I think uh, too, oh. No, go ahead. I love that no. he is free form. So players, I just love seeing what players bring to the table because mm -hmm. they always, when every person is free to just write down five words, mm -hmm. seven if you count the, the signature spell, like I just love hearing what those words are because mm -hmm. <laughs> it gets wild. Yeah. Uh, though that can also be daunting for people who... Uh, you know, don't work as well with open-ended questions or, uh, yeah. and who are better with, uh, with, you know, multiple choice tests, which again goes back to that, uh, those random tables in, yeah. the, in the random table section. So you get, you get the best of both worlds. And really, if you're having a hard time considering what your key would be, you can go to those random tables, roll a couple of those, pick from the menu. And in the course of doing so after your second or third choice, you might be, you might, something might click. So there, there's yeah. resources for both types of people. I, I was going to say, I, I kind of struggled with mine a little bit at first until I went and I looked at the random table and I read through it and I was saying, okay, I now have an idea of the type of words I should be looking to. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's not going to be, it's not going to necessarily be things that are 
necessarily like strong traits. It's not going to be necessarily like, you know, oh, he's always daring. It's going to be aspects of his personality that that can kind of shine through. Mm -hmm. And and I like that in particular that that these are little extra clues to who your character can be. I think like we got a really we got good portraits of Doyle and Kalos through their keys. We got a, like with Doyle, we got a portrait of somebody who is not a daring hero in a grand tradition who is mostly kind of just like a curious but kind of uh, a curious person with a strong sense of self-preservation that gets dragged into things is yeah. kind of what Doyle's key looks like. And Kalos's key has this great tension between heroic traits and very selfish ones. Yes. And I thought that that was like, that was an excellent painting of who we found out Kalos is, as someone who struggles a lot between wanting to be a hero and wanting to be selfish. Mm -hmm. And I, I also do like that this lends itself to flawed characters and, and flawed heroes, you know, because uh, I don't think, I don't real think characters it's unreasonable. Real exactly. It's not unreasonable yeah. for, for Kalos to be saying, why do I have to be the one to put my life on the line? Why yeah. do I have to be the one to march down there after all we've already been through? After all I've already done for a world that is likely to never know I did it. Mm -hmm. Why do I have to keep going? Especially if you're going to go pick up the Legion anyway. <laughs> yeah. Am I really going to add four successes to the successful? No, but, uh, yeah, totally. It's it's not an unreasonable stance to take. Mm -hmm. um, and seeing how you go from that to, well, I'm here and someone has to do it. You know, that that is, that's interesting. It's It's good storytelling. I think also, like, in the actual, like, heroic core, it's like, anyone can be a hero. And it's not... We talked about it particularly with like the sense of like disabilities and somebody who, you know, like how in more traditional games, like it's like if you are in a wheelchair, that's going to impact like something like that's like a going to impact like your movement or your combat or, or, or something like that. But it's like, no, like that doesn't affect it. But then at the same time, it's like not only in like physical disabilities or any sort of disabilities but it's also just any character you want to make can become a hero like as long because like it's also the idea that like you start out you've been a ranger like you've done it like you are a hero and then what character do you want to be based off of that like you can make somebody who was like yeah i'll be a ranger because that sounds super cool and that seems like really good and like uh, why not and then they find out that they hate it and they're like hey like actually i don't want to i don't want to do this anymore um, or you can be like play someone who's like, yeah, like I care about people and I'm doing this because I care about people and like that's what my life is for. And may but maybe the lesson is like, hey, like don't set yourself on fire to keep other people warm, you know, like but it's just yeah. like there's so many ways where you could create any sort of character and what define somebody who is heroic is literally just what you, what does your character think is heroic and what do you think is heroic that's mm -hmm. it like yeah and and there's tools to help define that and help help you as the player define that for your character throughout yeah. the entirety of the character creation process yeah i i i said it before i'll say it again i love systems that have narrative implications to character building and it's not just stats and abilities yeah. I just wanted it to be easy to do. Mm -hmm. And it was. And that was <laughs> that's, yeah. that was my, yeah. my biggest kind of guiding guiding star was just like I want I this is a different kind of game and I want to make that as easy for people to adapt to as possible. Mm -hmm. 
But as I started playing it, the more I started realizing that we were seeing in playtest games, non-standard heroes. Mm -hmm. We were seeing um, in the first ever playtest, Kirsten played a character who used a cane. She was a wailing arcanist who was injured on her pilgrimage. And <laughs> yeah, she's a, like, she's still an arcanist. She's still massively powerful. She has a cane. Deal with it. And that was when I realized, oh my goodness, if I don't have physical stats, players can have whatever kinds of mm -hmm. bodies they want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, um, if I don't have mental stats, people can have whatever kinds of minds they want. And that really kind of surprised me. I wish I'd say, I wish I could say it was my plan all along, but Kirsten, just by choosing to play a character with a cane, really drove that home. And then one of my favorite characters that's been played on Sword of Symphonies was when Nick was running his Velt story. Kathleen played a character who was a, a crusader with such PTSD that they were a blacksmith now. Like, just like what you were saying, they were like, no, I'm not a hero anymore. I'm not doing hero things. I did it. It sucked. I'm a blacksmith now. But okay, my best friend is going on an adventure and I'm not going to let her do it alone. But I'm not a hero. Don't call me a hero. Like, uh, Lane was a really incredible character. And that was a moment of exactly what Donna was saying. We're just like, no, Lane's not a hero. Well, Lane does the right thing in an epic adventure. So yeah, Lane's a hero, but they're not, they don't want to be. They mm -hmm. don't want to do hero stuff. Yeah. They just want to hit metal with a hammer. Yeah. Life, one of life's simple joys. <laughs> just hitting metal with a hammer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah but yeah. but being able to define define your character in interesting keywords that aren't necessarily tied to physical limitations of strength and dexterity and how intelligent you are and how good you are at talking to people or how pretty you are does allow you to make a lot of very interesting characters yeah one of uh, my favorite sort of symphonies npcs is lily who is autistic she's nonverbal. she is a volcanic tracker and an extremely formidable one she just doesn't like or get people mm -hmm. <laughs> like, and that's fine mm -hmm. <laughs> like that's fine with the party that's fine with the people who encounter her that's um and i really uh every so often we have a, a listener who will come out and say like hey i'm neurodivergent and seeing neurodivergent characters on the podcast uh really made me happy and mm -hmm. god that absolutely i'd like to say it made my day but it was months ago and I'm, I, it's still being made because it's like i want everybody to not only see themselves in the stories and sort of symphonies but be able to see themselves in the game in a mm -hmm. row of court so that was yeah and i i think that's something that's definitely accomplished again because you're defining your actions through the approach you take and not your limitations uh, and you're able to facilitate the approach you take with, uh, check this segue here, your spell pieces and how creatively yeah. you are at <laughs> defining your action. Uh, because there's a lot of instances where you can where you can just put a put a facet next to a skill, and there there's still a lot of creativity involved in negotiating what exactly uh, what you're picking and what that looks like as it plays out the scene. But I think even more than that, again, because it's it's things that you uh, you pick from pick from a list of uh, the spell pieces. And mixing those with the terrain pieces, you need to be able to think kind of on the fly. Uh, because it's not just your own pre-planned stuff. You have your pieces and the terrain pieces. Uh, so how you, the, the ones you pick say a lot to your character. And then how you link them to the terrain spell pieces says a lot about your character. And it allows you to really negotiate how you perceive your character and their action ability in the game. Because I know for a fact, in talking with uh, both Pat and Donna, I could give you the same two words, and you will tell me two completely different spells. 
Yep. Yeah. True. True. Honestly, the, the the spell pieces is one of my favorite parts of this. Um, hey. I love the idea of where you are affecting what magic you can do. Mm -hmm. And I love the idea that that magic isn't as rigid as, well, you have, um, you know, three magic missiles and two fireballs and one fly mm -hmm. spell, and that's it for the day. Like, <laughs> that's what you prepared, that's what you've got. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I like the idea that magic takes a toll on you rather than on resources that you carried with you and that you have to adapt to what's nearby. Mm -hmm. Yay! I also think it has like that added benefit of like just narratively feeling like rangers truly do draw their powers from like the land and the earth and like they're very connected in all of it. It feels like I don't know. I like the sense of like feeling like you both like they belong in mm -hmm. a way. I like the sense of like belonging and familiarity and like because it's what... drawing from themselves oh. as much it is from drawing from the, right. from the land. So it's like two halves coming together mm -hmm. and like making this spell and like advancing this thing or like, you know, saving people. And it's like this beautiful moment of just like harmony. <laughs> Because, because I, I mean, I, I, I am the person that realized that like heroic chord was like music based, like yeah. in the second session. Where I was like, oh, a chord, oh, <laughs> but, like, <laughs> and so then I was like, oh, okay, I see, I understand. Um, but yeah, it was just like this beautiful. It's like always like this beautiful moment. I think because it's like whatever you want to do is reliant on like nature around you as much as it reliant on like yourself. It's not mm -hmm. just like oh, I'm in underwater and i'll cast like a fireball but it's like no like i'll use the world around me to shape what i want to get done and what i want to achieve yay i love it mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. i mean i'm very landscape focused so i wanted to write a game that like incentivizes the gm to describe the landscape mm -hmm. was that in my headphones just now I didn't hear uh, anything about so. you talking. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think the batteries are running out on these bad boys. But um like I like a game that encourages the GM to think about the scene and to describe the scene and encourages players to react with to the scene because I just I think it makes it easier for everyone to picture and mm. I just like dramatic scenery. Yeah. I just love it. Okay, I'm gonna um be gone for a second mm -hmm. while I switch headphones. Cool, cool. Uh, yeah, I know. I uh, I am guilty of sometimes over overdressing or overemphasizing my scenes. I know I am not a succinct person, uh, but a but a game like this kind of uh, kind of exasperates <laughs> that issue. Uh, so I do hope that I didn't drone on too long about how uh, how massive the tangle was or how. Uh, I don't know, whatever the scenes may be, but I do like that it encourages engagement with the environment and your surroundings. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and I I really do like adding the terrain aspect because as Donna pointed out, a fireball underwater doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Uh and and so, you know. Having what magic? Well, yeah. yeah, but but magic can only explain away so far. Yeah, no, I'm, you know, I'm with you. You <laughs> you could maybe boil a small area of water before it's immediately like dissipated through actual physics into thermodynamics and all that, and you know, very good. Like there, there's there's all kinds of ways that there's you can no explain physics away. In ye olde fantasy land. Well then, I don't need a fly <laughs> spell anymore. Congratulations. Yep. Yep. But you know, it, it's it's nice that that it makes you think a little bit more about how and why certain things would work. Mm -hmm. And I like having to look at the surroundings and say, "All right, what here can I work with?" Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And I, I one of one of my big things is I really like defining the the scene, defining the scenario 
But then I also really like having players be like, hey, it'd be really interesting if this was here. We're in the middle of the street. I could use some cover. But it takes too long to get behind that car, or maybe that's a really nice car, I don't want to blow it up. Is there a manhole cover nearby? It's not on the map. I didn't think of it as a GM, but you know what? That sounds great. There's a manhole cover. Have at it. And I think sounds having... Fun. Uh, the the spell pieces in the way they are in the fact in in the sense that it does necessitate a conversation and a negotiation it encourages and almost again necessitates the the players creatively adding to their environment mm -hmm. which i think we've seen a number of times yeah we didn't creatively subtract from the environment by burning the town down yeah that's true yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well it's like it's like in the uh the final conflict looking for the energy shield to set up a barrier yeah. to you know add to the advantage pool and things exactly. you know? yeah. like mm -hmm. uh, you know we we don't always necessarily have an exact detailed layout of what's around us but if we can come up with something that makes sense oh i want to roll adaptability survival to see if i can find mm -hmm. uh an energy shield to put up around us yeah. well yeah there you go yeah and that rolls back around to collaborative storytelling because the gm can't be responsible for for holding the entire uh narrative interest and i'll be completely transparent uh the idea of having these uh the the hearts of thorns was not a thing until doyle went down that well and he's like i'm looking for where's the center of this what yep. what's what's the cause of all very this? very good i didn't have very anything prepared oh heart of thorns there you go it was good and that was had. brilliant and I, it you know, it snowballed into so many other things because of that so i like always encourage imagery for yeah. it i love it i always encourage my players to be like hey what's down here does this exist how can i use this i would like to use this like that can we do that uh and the rules in this game and how creative and keyword focused they are really facilitate that yay at the same time, uh, again, uh, is this game for you conversation, if you're not the person who enjoys critical, creative thinking on an improv, seat of your pants kind of, kind of gameplay, this, this game might not be for you. There's a lot of that in this game. Uh, yeah, yeah, you have to negotiate it. What, if, if you, if you don't like, uh, improv creativity and or you don't like negotiating and, and having a conversation <laughs> and debating and reasoning between player and gm uh, you, you might find a different game um because it, it it can it can be i can see it being daunting for some people to look at a list of six words and a list of another six words and have to think of right there on the spot I have 12 words. How do I get these together? What do they do? Uh, and I mean, that can that can be difficult for people when they have a, a, a list of D&D &D spells, just just picking between your turn. What spell do I use? How is it going to be useful in this situation? This person just did this. Now this spell doesn't doesn't matter. Uh, so some people prefer picking from menus. Some people prefer coming up with things on the fly and improv and and creative uh, analysis and creation, collaborative storytelling. Uh, if if you prefer a menu based system uh you know there there's other games for that but if you do really enjoy uh you know just just rolling with the improv coming up with creative solutions bouncing ideas back and forth between players working with the gm uh this is an excellent game for that and i think more yeah. importantly from the gm side of things you have to want things to work for your players you cannot be an adversarial gm and run this game you can't do it it's not possible uh, or if it is, it would not be any fun for anybody because yeah. you have to, as a GM, you have to negotiate in good faith. You have to be transparent. Mm -hmm. You have to provide challenges and and tactical and ethical questions for them to deal with. Is it worth this number of successes? Is it worth the damage for this edge success? If I do this, this happens, yada, yada. But you have to want the best outcome for the players. Mm -hmm. Because if your only goal is pulling one over on them, it's this this game does not facilitate that. Um, yeah, and it, it just wouldn't be fun. 
There, there's other games that do that much better if that's the kind of GM you are and the kind of players you're working with. But I don't think either I don't think either that kind of GM or those kind of players necessarily fit with this game. Yeah, I I think I, I've played I'm the kind of indie designer who's played with the bad kind of adversarial GM who didn't check for player buy-in before just trying to massacre us. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result, I don't love the adversarial GM model because mm -hmm. I had really lousy experiences yeah. with it. Oh, I'm right there and with you. <laughs> so, so yeah, I did deliberately design a game that was like, no, your, your GM is helping you tell a story. The GM, my favorite part of GMing Heroic Chord is just like coming up with a thing that is happening putting a scene full of stuff down and just seeing what the players do with mm -hmm. their weird little brains. Yeah. And if you, if you like your players, weird little brains. Just the good weird. thing was that like Jack did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. The good thing was that like Jack was like, Hey, do some improv and then yeah. um pat and i did and jack was like i like your weird little brain let's go <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah yeah pretty much yeah and and you know i i feel like there there are definitely tables where an adversarial gm is what you're looking for and there are mm -hmm. players that are looking for that but and I systems always... that facilitate that yes and absolutely systems that facilitate it but i i always looked at it more like the gm is the referee between the consequences and the players. You're not there necessarily to railroad your players into doing one thing or another. You're not there necessarily trying to kill them. You're there making sure that the rules are enforced and the story can move forward. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's kind of how I've always tried to look at it. And I feel like this system does a really great job of that because you're not working against the players in a system like this you can't be because mm -hmm. if you're <laughs> if you're working against the players you can just say all right well no yeah, that's going to cost you 15 lose. scatter that's you not that's not just, yeah <laughs> and and you have to negotiate in good faith i i think that this system is great for that type of storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, if you are looking for an adversarial GM, probably not the system for you. But yeah. you know, in in my experience, in my experience, yes and or yes or are much better than just flat out no. Yeah, they make for a better story. And I'm not saying there's no place for saying no. I'm saying that the reason the rule is yes and or no but in improv, well, yeah. is because that makes for a more entertaining game. Yeah. I, I'm a big fan of no but. Yeah, no but is also a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do that one a lot. Um, I'm also a big fan of you can certainly try. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I... I also find that adversarial GM models work be work better with very crunchy games where so many of the systems and rules decide um, decide what happens, not the GM. Mm -hmm. It takes enough power away from the GM that they're not just like single-handedly clobbering the player unless they're yeah. really, really yeah. adversarial, yeah. in which case no yeah. one has fun. But like OSR games where you roll for fall damage... You can have an adversarial GM in that one because they're not the one who they don't just say, okay, you fall, you die. Like it's not actually in their hands. Mm. Yeah. This is a significantly less uh, granular game. Mm -hmm. this, this is a game that definitely prioritizes, pretty much requires cooperation. It's, it's not yeah. a competitive game. And you can have competitive tabletop games, competitive tabletop parties. But I think in Heroic Chord, the players and the GM have to, at least 90% of the time, be working with each other in good faith. To, to have the most enjoyable story, at the very least. The most enjoyable time yeah. with the system itself. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, well, 
we are running up on time here and i think we've had a, a really good conversation about pretty much pretty much everything really Yay. uh is there is there anything anyone wants to add to this conversation any topics we didn't cover yet any crazy theories that didn't pan out any nagging questions doyle lives, doyle lives. <laughs> That that that's a T-shirt. Doyle lives. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I don't I don't have anything that I could like be adding, but I just want to say, Kat, you made a really good game. You really yeah. did. This was a lot yeah. of fun. I'm mm -hmm. so glad that you all had fun. Yeah, like I had a lot of fun playing with you. You you all did a wonderful job. So it's um, just really fun. I don't. Yay! Honestly, like. At this point, I'll just be like a heroic cord saleswoman. Oh. <laughs> just be like chilling, like, hey, did you try this new this game? Yeah, like, I had a lot of fun. Let me tell you something. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Not, nah, nah, nah. You're too sweet. You're all too sweet. Well, yeah, I mean, that's. Call me back here anytime. I'll like I'll be I'll be in the player's seat for someone else's yeah. game. Like I had so much fun during this arc that yeah i'll do it yeah definitely i mean you guys you guys are a permanent feature on my uh my call list now my roster so uh yeah be on the lookout keep yeah. your schedules open <laughs> yeah. uh yeah mm -hmm. i'm so glad that you all had fun because one thing that kind of accidentally happened to heroic chord is that because the play test was a podcast mm. it accidentally did become a game that was built for built to be played for an audience mm -hmm. because we play tested it for an audience and that's just kind of what shook out mm -hmm. so uh every time that i like do a stream with somebody or uh, someone plays like a podcast one shot or something like it, it warms my little heart because that's i think where the game really shines is in telling stories for an audience yeah so there's Yay. definitely a different brain space and a different creative thinking process that I know I have uh, running a game, playing a game, designing a game for just the people at the table rather than as, a, as an entertainment media for an audience. But yeah. I think having experience now with the latter has made me better at the former. Um. Yeah. Just a little aside. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that, uh, yeah, that was, that was another thing I was going to say. That's another key aspect, uh, Donna, of RPGs Uncovered, expanding the TTRPG horizons. Not only do I want to, you know, teach people new games, but I want to, I want to get people excited about other games. And not every, not every season is going to interest every player, uh, but I mean, if if I can get people to recommend other people's games, that that's another win in my column. Whether whether you're here as a player, you're here as an audience member, uh, whether you're just listening to, whether you're just watching the the tutorials or watching things over on YouTube, and you go, "Hey, GM, this sounds like a cool game. Do you want to try this out?" Or you go to a convention, or you're talking at your local game store with people, or who are like, you know, I like D and D, but I wish it, you know, had creative keywords and you had more flexibility with magic, and you could go, "Well, have you heard of?" heroic chord uh, so it, it's it's not just about learning new games but it's about bringing people into the hobby and expanding that horizon the more games you play yeah. the the more fun you're going to have <laughs> uh, that yeah. that's 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 my big takeaway i i play plenty of DD, &D, but i know i've enjoyed D, D more and i've added more interesting things to my D, &D after playing a lot of other games because you get so many new perspectives from from a role play aspect from a creative thinking aspect a story aspect looking at things from different genre perspectives uh so even even if you're you know hardcore ye old fantasy land D, &D player you know go play cyberpunk red for a little bit and see what it brings to the table yeah i think like we talk a lot about how the indie scene suffers from the hegemony of D&D, where, like, the scene would be a better place if there wasn't one immovable pillar that it re revolved around. But we don't often talk about how D&D also suffers from that. That, like, the expectation that it be all things to all people yeah. is not great for D&D either. Mm -hmm. And also, 
yeah, like playing other games will improve your ability to play D&D as well. And yeah. you will enjoy that game more for what it is when you play it for what it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so viewing it as the default doesn't do literally anyone any favors, not yeah. even the default. You'll, you'll have I mean, less screaming matches about your fun is wrong if you realize you can have different fun with different things. Yeah. Also that. No, but uh, I, you're you're absolutely right about playing, seeing D and D differently after playing other games because I've definitely been playing in my five E game that I'm a player in. I've been playing differently since starting the heroic chord game with you all. Aww. You know, I've been thinking more about character motivations and thinking more about well, narratively, would losing here make more sense and and it's mm. it's definitely i think elevated my role play in my 5e game Ooh, that's good to hear i'm very glad to hear that role play boot camp yeah, yeah. <laughs> honestly yeah. her court should be like if if you if anyone runs like a role play like boot camp of like how to get into role playing and how to better understand and put yourself in the shoes of like a character the character you create like heroic court should be the system that they play oh that's, that's just that's just that's just my take yeah this is my take. <laughs> I've, been trying, I've been trying to get my mama to play uh to play role playing games with me I recently convinced her to play Lasers and Feelings because she loves Star Trek very much. Uh, I've always good. been concerned that Heroic Chord might be too complicated because my mama is extremely intelligent. Make no mistake, my mama is uh, quite, quite smart, but she doesn't think she is. Mm. So um, she's very easily put off things that don't seem like she could grasp them right away. Mm -hmm. And so I've been hesitant to introduce her to this game, but hearing you all say how beginner friendly it is, maybe it's worth a shot. Yeah, I think it's like definitely I'd absolutely worth it. say yeah. that. Yeah. Well, you I should just like yeah. You should What's direct her to my channel. Bring <laughs> them out of your channel. That sounds that sounds like another subscriber to me. Yeah. <laughs> like mommy, <laughs> mama, have you considered mama. this? Yeah. But like yeah, like I think I think your mom would really like it as well. Like it's beginner friendly and it's a load of fun because it really like encourages the imagination. Mm. Like yeah, she loves imagination stuff. I don't know why she didn't play role playing games in the seventies when they were invented. Well, because they couldn't. used to summon demons back then. They had to weed that out. They, that was the yeah. 80s. Yeah. in the seventies. It was okay. <laughs> mm. Mm. Humans hadn't been invented till the 80s. That's that's true. That's true. But <laughs> to be fair, though, ba back then, role playing games were equal parts imagination and math, and that turned a lot of people off from them. Yeah. Not this dweeb. <laughs> Not listen, my dork ass mother. <laughs> <laughs> You, I, I, hey, maybe Nerd. don't make her watch this part. Don't make her watch this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> tell her, tell her it ended five minutes ago. Here's here's my tragic nerd backstory. I was in third grade, and we read Voyage of the Dawn Treader, and mm. I was eight, and mm. I was over the moon. I had never read a story like this that took place in a fantastical other land with magic and dragons. I love Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And I got home from school super excited to tell my mom about the cool book I was reading. And she was like, oh, eight-year-old daughter? That's Narnia. I have a whole Narnia box set from when I was your age. And when you're done, Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, go be done by Family Star Trek time. <laughs> and it was... yep. Love it. Love it. <laughs> That's my upbringing. <laughs> Family Star so Trek great. time. Family That's Star so Trek great. Time. <laughs> I still tease her about it. <laughs> so I didn't have a choice in the matter. <laughs> Neither does Mama. You're going to be a nerd whether you like it or not. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Well, that's been... I Thank you all for encouraging me. I think I am going to make my mother play heroic chord with me. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe my cute baby sister, too, if she's got time. There you yeah. go. Yeah. It's always a good idea to try to get new people into gaming. I mean, yeah. the worst that could happen is you have one awkward session and you don't do it again. Or you could be introducing somebody to a new lifelong hobby in a great way, great creative outlet, great personal outlet. 
a uh, great learning situation, a uh, great yeah. way to make friends. Role playing's great, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not for everyone. If you don't enjoy it, eh, well, okay, you you wasted a couple hours, got a little awkward, okay, you move on. Or you could start doing this for the rest of your life and meet incredible people like these guys. It's so fun and good and cool. Yeah. All right. Well, I think uh, we are at time. We could continue gushing for the rest of forever. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we're at time, and I think we've done a pretty good job of talking about pretty much everything this game has to offer. Uh, and... Um, had a nice wrap up for our story, which I just adored. Uh, I adored having you guys as players. Uh, the characters you created were so thoughtful and so ingrained in the story. And you guys really engaged. Uh, the, like I like I said before, this uh, this this story, this show, this game. Uh, it is made best with with the players. Uh, a good GM is nothing without good players, and you you guys were were the best of players for what we Aww. did here. We uh, we we made the best story. Uh, we made we truly made the best story that that I think we we could together, and it far surpassed uh my, you know the the expectations I hold at least for myself. Uh, so it it's been an absolute pleasure watching you guys and helping you guys through this story and, and watching you guys and helping you guys through learning and navigating this game. It's been a great time for me. Yay. And Yay. Likewise, you, we, you told an incredible story and we, I had a great time being part of it. I had a Absolutely. great time <laughs> hanging out with Pat and Donna and hanging out with Doyle and Kalos. Mm -hmm. It was good. It was very good. It was a good yeah. time. A good time. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's where we're going to leave it. Uh, I definitely have more stuff to be posting to our support sites, Ko-Fi and Patreon. You can go check those out once more. And definitely more things coming to YouTube, just because this is the uh, official end of the streaming season, sad tier. Uh, there will still be more of this season coming uh, on on the support channels for other uh, support supplementary stuff that you're going to get while I work towards season three, which I should be announcing shortly. Ooh, exciting! Yeah, yeah, I'm uh, I'm really looking forward to it. There's 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 some hiccups. I'll be transparent. There's some hiccups right now. I'm I'm hoping we can push through it. I'm really excited for what we have planned. I definitely have something planned. Uh, but sometime in the third dandy calendar uh april uh yeah sometime the third week of april we should be back for season three but i should have some fun things planned in the interim and uh we'll see what we do in the meantime uh yeah but i guess i guess this is the end of rpgs uncovered season two with heroic chord uh i'm not going to go through the whole you guys are awesome speech again we've done that plenty of times <laughs> uh nice. but uh yeah you, you guys are you're obviously in the discord anyone in in chat in our audience can come hang out on our discord there should be links below whether that's in twitch or youtube you should be able to uh just connect straight to our discord come hang out with all of us ask questions talk about the game, talk about crazy conspiracies, ask about running your own game, bounce ideas off of us. Uh, and not just me, not just Kat, not just uh, the four people on the screen here, but there's a lot of other great people on the Discord, lots of other great creators and players, play testers, all that stuff. We're a little quiet sometimes uh, because right now we all have our own things going on because it's mostly uh, creators and other uh other streamers and whatnot but a great resource for finding new games talking about story talking about mechanics whatever you whatever you have to discuss come hang out there um yeah i'm just i'm just uh i'm just blabbering because i don't want it to be over <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> I know that feel. I know that. It, it is a Aww. mutual feeling. I gotta, this was yeah. incredible. I gotta stop yeah. the recording sometime. 
Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm thinking of declaring myself the king of the Fantasyland channel on the People's Ascension Discord. I feel mm. like I can run on a uh, unopposed for the role of king. Yeah. And um rule that maybe with an iron fist is something that I'm kind of considering. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So So if you want to overthrow a tyrant, you you better hop in. <laughs> <laughs> was, uh, you like had established yourself and man that iron curtain's coming down oh, God. Immediately. <laughs> love it i'm uh, love honestly it. fair and valid <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah i like to think we're a great community but i'm kind of biased come hang out with us on discord on twitter there's a lot of cool stuff there uh come check out our support sites leave comments on the youtube videos any sort of feedback any sort of engagement is helpful i mean even complain and tell me how horrible job i did because i might be able to take that in improve and improve you never know i'm open to criticism or if you're just being a jerk well i mean i know jerks exist i can be a jerk sometimes we're all jerks a little uh just uh just take some time and descatter. you know do whatever you need to do yeah uh yeah okay that's that support sites that's social if you had fun go tell other people about our show definitely go check out uh heroic chord and everything else cat has done i will throw that link in uh in chat as well peach garden games for you to check out Yay! heroic chord uh sort of symphonies uh blazing him that's the other one Lots of great stuff on there. Uh, so if you do want more Heroic Chord, you're not going to find it here, but go check out that podcast because it, it really is super entertaining. It's great stuff over Aww. there. Yay. Okay, Yay. that's uh, that's all I have. So let, let me throw it back to you guys for your final uh, leaving thoughts and goodbyes. Let's, let's, uh, let's go in reverse order again. Donna. Last time, at least for this season, I give everyone a fond farewell and let us let us know where we'll find you until we see you next. I want to start off my final farewell with uh, Doyle Lives. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, guys. My name is Donna. You can find me at Shabro. That's X-I-A-B-R-O. I'm on Twitter. I just got cast in a couple of visual novels that are a part of Nano Reno 2022, which is just a huge month-long push for visual novels. So that's been really fun. Should be a lot of really cool games. I'm excited to lend my voice to some really gnarly characters. So come on over, check out, um, and maybe play those games if you want to. But yeah, this has been super fun. Um, I'm going to you know, just a single tear going down both of my cheeks as I think about uh, this crew and this party and how much fun we had. It has been a really, really wonderful time. Thank you so much to Jack for having me. Thank you so much to Kat for creating this game. And to Pat, you killed it. I had so much fun playing with you. And it's bittersweet to say goodbye. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, likewise, yes. Pat, until we see you next, what are you up to? I'm, I'm Pat or Badger the Cynic. Uh, you can find me at Badger the Cynic on Twitter. And soon I'll be launching my own Twitch channel um, where I'm going to be playing a Savage Worlds game that I've been running for two years. The next chapter is going to be online, going to be twitch.tv slash Badger the Cynic. I'll also probably do a little bit of variety streaming, um, you know, play a couple of games on Steam, things like that. Um, Right now, though, I don't have anything I'm I'm actively doing there. This was my streaming debut, and I am so glad that Jack took a chance on me. Um, this was an incredible experience. It was great working with Donna and Kat. It's an incredible game, Heroic Court, and I, I can't recommend it enough. And, you know, thank you all so much. It's been a pleasure having you with us, and I'm I'm glad to see we haven't turned you off to streaming. <laughs> glad <laughs> glad to see you doing doing more of your own stuff. I look forward to uh to some of your announcements in the future. Mm. Uh, and of course, the the reason we've all had the pleasure of this entire series, uh, cat creator of this fantastic game. What would you like hi. to leave us with? Um, well, I'm not saying goodbye because you said that we're on your callback roster, yeah, so true. I can't wait to play Until with, I see with you next everybody event. again. Yes, true. I can't, it's going to be great to play with everybody again. I can't wait. Um, let's see. 
I'm Kat. Uh, hi. Um, Jack's already told you, but you can find my stuff at peachgardengames.com. Um, I'm working on Roar to Heaven, which is the Blazing Him actual play podcast that is significantly less uh, cuddly than this game is. And um, it's it's about angels trying to massacre humanity. And it's it's even more of a transparent anime fan game than Heroic Court is. And I, there's power in that, I think. Um, I'm really excited to see everybody again. I'm excited to play together with everyone because I had a wonderful time. This was a beautiful story that had beautiful characters in it. And uh, this has also been tre tremendously affirming for me as a designer. The knowledge that somebody can, with just my manual, put something like this together uh, means I did something right. And um, heaven knows that is welcome to hear. And um, I had a great time. Um, the Oh, yeah, the other thing is that the playtest version of this manual is free. So if you're watching mm -hmm. this... And you're like, I want to try this game, but I don't want to shell out. That's okay. The playtest version, plain text, is mm -hmm. completely free. Try it out with your group. Please let me know if you did. I would love to hear it if you did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, come over to Discord and share your stories. We'll open up a, a channel there if you're interested in that. I'm the king of fantasy land. Bring yeah. it to me in my audience chamber. There you go. And see seek audience with the king. Yeah. <laughs> uh yeah uh and and likewise uh of course all of the uh the tutorial videos and their reference sheets are free on our support sites you don't need to sign up you don't need to donate you don't need to uh you know pledge a monthly amount just go over there check them out if you see other cool things hints at other little things you might want to uh get get your hands on get your eyes on you know there's some cool stuff over there if you do support but we're all about teaching games so i'm not locking that behind uh behind pay so uh go pick up the free version of the manual go watch uh the tutorials i hope you have enjoyed this show and that it was informative and inspirational uh and of course if you really like what to, what we're doing both me and cat go support cat by picking up the uh the absolutely beautiful version uh -huh. of the game over on itch and uh you know consider supporting me over on our support sites Anything we get through that goes right back into the community with being able to, you know, purchase new games, uh, purchase, uh, you know, work with people, uh, other other creators uh, for character art and maps and music and animated intros and emotes and badges and all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, I have a I have a lot of huge checklist of things I would love to get done. Uh, and I do hope that this channel only continues to grow because I am all about meeting new creators, meeting new players, facilitating new players and new GMs, highlighting new things, expanding the TTRPG horizons, as I like to say. With Ooh. that, I think that's all I have to leave you with. And unfortunately, we will be leaving for a little bit. A little bit, uh, but it is very literally Vitor Zane to see you again sometime. Uh, we will all be back, I'm sure. I know I will be with more RPGs Uncovered content. So until then, everybody stay safe, stay happy, stay healthy, keep having fun out there, keep checking back here at RP at the People's Essential for more RPGs Uncovered content. And you know, when you finish up a game with lovely people, a lovely system. It's nice to sit down with a nice celebratory banquet of heart tomatoes. Yep. Thanks for joining us, everybody, and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye.